So we'll call the we'll call the meeting to order at 7 p.m. And we have we're joined by NORCAM for those in attendance, and NORCAM will be uh, broadcasting, and this meeting will be recorded. And we'll begin with the recitation of the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'm joined by my colleagues, Mr. O'Leary, Mrs. Gonzalez, Mr. Walner, and Mr. Studo. So our first order of business is the minutes of the November 2nd, 2020 regular session. Madam Chair, I move to approve the November 2nd, 2020 regular session minutes as written. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Madam Being, Chair. Yeah, Mr. I, Gilberto. I believe that there were a couple of proposed revisions that were being floated by one of the members. Um, there was a revised document that was in the folder as well. Uh, Mr. Walner, I think you had some suggestions. Did you want to review them for the board members or? I uh, just, um, my, my short thing was um, that Phil Hertz's last name wasn't spelled properly. And the other one was, I had said about a conflict between the liaison and the chair. And I meant chair, but I meant chair of the ZBA not to be confused with chair of our board. So I just wanted to, as a clarification, if anybody read that, they may not know the context. And I want to just put down an ad that I wasn't referring to the chair of the board. I was referring to the chair of the ZBA. That was my only two things. So to make that motion with Mr. Waller's amendments, is that what you, Mr. Gilberto, did? That's why you raised that. I did. He suggested revisions and we did upload a revised version into the meeting folder. Okay. So to, so motion motion as amended do we have a second to that motion a second sure. yep. so mr uh so motion by mr studo with amendment to incorporate mr walner's uh revisions is seconded by mr o'leary and any further discussion seeing none mr o'leary aye mrs gonzalez aye mr walner aye mr studo aye and Manny Pelly is I. <clears throat> our next order of business is a COVID-19 update. Mr. Gilberto. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. A couple of things of, of note. Um, the first is, and I'm reporting from our most recent um, meeting um, with regard to COVID-19 response last Tuesday, uh, we were reporting 322 cases in total here in North Reading, with 42 being actively monitored 14 deaths total, including a suspected death, and 266 recovered cases. Um, we saw quite a, a, an uptick in activity um, between November 3rd and November 10th, uh, where we saw 28 cases in that seven day span. Um, so um, I think it's no surprise to anybody that there has been an uptick in activity. Um, I, you know, I've mentioned um, to some of the board members uh, between the meetings that we've had um, a couple of cases of uh, positive cases involving um, employees of the town. Um, and and in, in those cases, we've been applying the CDC guidelines for contact tracing in conjunction with the public health nurse and making determinations for close contacts and notifying people as well as following the appropriate uh, cleaning protocols. Um, reminding folks um, of the importance of following the social distancing requirements um, and wearing, uh, wearing masks and hand washing as well. So we really continue to, to um, push that information out for folks. Um, the uh, public buildings remain closed for the general public to um, for uh, um, walk-in services, although we continue to offer by appointment services here in the town hall, as well as at the library for the pick up and drop off of books. And if necessary, uh, over at the Council on Aging as well, and that is likely to be the setup that continues for the uh, the foreseeable future. Um, we do feel we've been able to meet the need in the community, um, and and it's really because of our employees and their willingness to be flexible and to really go above and beyond to make sure we respond to folks. Um, just kind of transitioning a bit from the the data points and the and the direct public health end of things. 
Um, there were a couple of letters that I uploaded into the meeting packet that I thought were worthy of reviewing under this agenda item, um, and they relate to um, funding. Um, and so uh, the board members have their packets open. The first letter is shortly after the minutes. I'm just kind of just scroll to the page. Page 24 of the meeting packet, um, where it speaks to the um, uh, a letter to state leadership uh, with regard to uh, making funding available for local health departments uh, before the end of this calendar year. It's for $15 million. Um, so we've received some funding that came through very early on in a second round that came through in the summertime as well um, that addressed um, funding for the Board of Health. Um, this would be a request for additional funding. And then the second letter would go to the, our federal legislative delegation, our congressional delegation, relative to CARES Act funding, which I think we're all aware is going to be expiring on December 30th and uh, for which there's no successor funding in place. These are letters that would normally be signed by um, mayors of uh, communities and they came to me through a working group of um, north of Boston uh, mayors. Um, so I felt it was appropriate to review them with the board and see if there was a, a feeling that we should um, sign on to one or both of these to request this, uh, this assistance from the state and federal government. Thank you, Mr. Gilberto. To the members, um, any, first of all, any questions on the update and any thoughts on the letter? Mr. O'Leary, the two letters, Mr. O'Leary. Yeah, I have a, some related thoughts in relation to uh, <clears throat> the letters that are being proposed here. It's interesting, you know, just in the last two weeks, you know, a lot's gone on. We've had an election and then we've also had a significant increase in, uh, in cases here. You know, we've surpassed 11 million cases here in the United States, nearly 250,000 people have died. The U.S. is now averaging 150,000 cases in the last week, an increase of 81% since the last time we met two weeks ago. Uh, nearly 70,000 Americans are in hospitals with COVID, up 87% from a month ago. Uh, science, the scientists are uh, predicting by Inauguration Day, which is the 20th of January, 2,000 to 2,500 Americans will be dying every day. Uh, all despite the promising news of vaccines uh, that won't reach you or I until April uh, at the earliest. In the meantime, we haven't got any acknowledgement from the federal level, this administration and current president, you know, that uh, of the results of the election, which will allow for a smooth transition from one administration to the next to address this very issue, along with a whole host of other issues which are important to the country, the state and our even local community. And that um, I think we need to continue to speak up. You know, I think we need to sign uh, sign on to these letters. And, and I know that it's generally mayors and um, town administrators, town managers, that sort of thing. But I, I think it should go under the signature of uh, the town administrator and the chair of our board for both of these. I mean, I'm less concerned about the, the state level other than, you know, them digging into their pockets a little bit deeper for us to... Uh, to help us address the situation. But right now there is no national game plan as to how we're going to um, administer this vaccine, how we're gonna to continue to address uh, what needs to be done. Uh, the deadline of December 31st to utilize the funds which were originally appropriated needs to be expanded and pushed off uh, for a significant time period so that we can access those funds. And again, the, the Congress, the United States Congress needs to uh, enact another stimulus bill, which would include, and again, the Republican Senate has refused to include uh, assistance to state and local governments. So, you know, we need, we need to continue to speak up and I think it's incumbent upon us to do so uh, in this particular fashion and any other fashion we can come up with. So you're in favor of us and I think you are also wanting more, you want the board sign off on these, Mr. O'Leary, right? I do. Okay, and do you have other, other questions in terms of any updates or, or anything like that? So, so these two letters you're in favor. I think we'll take a vote at the end after everyone has yeah, an favor. The only question I have, and I, I asked the town administrator this earlier, is you know, what kind of a state are we in here locally to assist with um, you know, putting out the vaccine and what do we anticipate the cost to be and how is it going to be covered? And again, these letters address part of those concerns. So, you know, my question is, you know, how ready are we? And uh, what do we need to do to get ready? And we're gonna need more resources to do it. So uh, if he has any uh, 
ideas yet as to how we're going to address it. I'd, I'd like to hear that too. Sure. So, I mean, I, I will, I'll report, you know, to the, the, the operational end of it, which is that the, uh, the board of health has been discussing for the past couple of meetings, the importance of dedicating resources to uh, vaccine distribution. And um, I know that the health director had, um, had um, thought and suggested to the board of health that a, an intern, um, some professional intern, not, not, excuse me, not professional, but an intern with some experience in public health who has become available to us would be able to assist with taking um, our um, dispensing plans and aligning them with the state guidance that I think came out in um, the middle part of last month. So, you know, the Board of Health has been discussing this. And I, see, I do see that Stephanie is on there this evening. Stephanie, uh, the, thank you for joining us um, for the, uh, the discussion. But, um, you know, they've been looking at this and they've come up with a, a model to try to um, make sure that we're prepared to play our part in distributing. In terms of the financial resources, um, you know, we, we do have um, a number of resources that are available to us, um, but we are also finding that the, the landscape continues to evolve, both in terms of the expenses associated for municipal government, but as well as um, the expenses associated with the school department as well. And so the finance director and I have been in touch with the um, school superintendent and the school, uh, the assistant superintendent for finance and operations um, to try to um, continually update our budgets for the, that funding. But that funding does run out, um, if not in dollar amount, um, in, uh, in time to spend it as well. So um, it's kind of why I felt that, you know, even if we may feel like we're in you know, decent shape right now going through December 30th, you know, beyond that period of time is a significant question mark for us right now that this presents an opportunity for us to continue to speak, uh, to, to push forward our concerns and our, and our needs. Thank you. Mrs. Gonzalez, questions uh, and your input on the letters. Um, I, I am for the letters and I would just like to respond to Mr. O'Leary, who always seems to find a way to trash the president and the Republican Party when it has nothing to do with anything. I'd just like to respond that we have a vaccine because of Trump's initiative for warp speed that got it here as quickly as it did get here. Um, and as far as a stimulus, if, you know, if the Democrat Party would keep it clean and stop adding pork to it, maybe it would get moved along. That's okay, all. so we want to keep, we want to basically keep our commentary to the business at hand. That would be nice, but I am going to respond when I need to. Uh, it's okay I, to respond, but as far I, as the pork. I don't, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to actually call us to order. Let's, but just now, you know what, no, we're not, we're not. We're, we're focusing on the business at hand, okay? Right. So both of you have had your piece. Let's move on. Mr. Waller, do you have any questions of the COVID-19 update? And please let me know your input without getting into politics. I'm because... not going to get into politics. I don't, <laughs> yeah. don't want to do it. Uh, no, it's, it's all, I mean, everybody here is what I hear, which is it's dire. You know, everything's dire coming forward. We need as many resources as possible. And the more pressure we can speak as a community, to address this because it is a health concern. It's no other concern but a health concern. We need all the resources we can possibly get. Every expression that we can provide our leaders, our political people to get it done is good, is a good thing. So <clears throat> let's pile it on and let's just keep asking for more and just insist that we get it because people need it and it's an awful situation. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Walner. Mr. Studo. The letters and any kind of question. That so I agree on the letters and I'd say maybe either tweak or edit the one we have or do another one. Um, yeah. So the U.S. government is going to pretty much the federal government cover the cost of the actual dose. The issue for the town and every municipality is going to be distribution, which that has not been negotiated. Um, so I think that it's something where maybe focusing on the the idea that yes we it does seem uh unless you know 25 different analysts that i've read about today are wrong it seems that the money for the actual vaccines are in for towns well for everyone but the problem is going to be the distribution and that is where i think maybe a separate letter or, or something again it, it's asking for aid but being more specific to where you know we think i i just feel that you know, again, I, I think our 
our signature from you, Madam Chair, is going to mean a lot from this board and the TA, but I feel that it's kind of like making a blanket ask or for something. I feel like when you get to the detail, it, it, it just, it maybe it'll reach the right people better when it's like very detailed rather than give us more money because COVID and people are dying. More of, okay, we know this is it, but this is one thing that's looming that no one's talked about yet because it's not, like I like to say, like you said, man, like it's not politically sexy. No one, like distribution is not, who wants to talk about distribution? But that's where, that's really where the money uh, is going to be needed for us. So maybe if we can tweak the letter for that, but but I, I think, yeah, I agree. I think the as many letters as we can write about this, you know, kind of like uh, in Shawshank Redemption when uh, Andy Dufresne keeps writing letters until they give him the books. <laughs> and we do one of those. So, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Strudo. And I, I, I agree that they, they should be, they look like templates and I think we could, we could maybe edit them a little bit to be more, com a little bit more compelling, even though this is a, a incredibly compelling circumstance. Mr. Strudo, I had not read that. All I have read and understand is that we, the, the taxpayer funds went to the pharmaceutical companies to develop this, but that, not, that we, there's been no commitment on the part of the pharmaceutical companies not to charge for the vaccine. I hadn't heard that it's being paid for, oh, so it'll come so out. Pfizer, just to clarify for you, Pfizer is going to price its vaccine in 1950 a dose, and the initial contract with the U.S. government is for 100 million doses. So that's her so, so, But I do agree that that you know we need to hear from the board of health obviously working in conjunction with yeah and i i didn't i didn't know that pfizer so pfizer is still charging for the vaccine but what you're saying is it's going to be rolled out for free and i hadn't heard that well so. free free to i mean you know free to the end user but it's coming out of tax money to pay for it but yeah but it's not going to be something where um and again there's just the reason is too, I'm not in the health business, but from an investment standpoint, Moderna and Pfizer have been all over the news every day, all day now for like right. two weeks. So meaning yeah. I probably read more on these two companies than any scientist working in the lab just because every client wants to know about it. So but right. that's one of the big things today. And same right. thing for Moderna. They're actually, they're actually going to charge us less than the rest of the world, which is, you know, you can say what you want about that, but yeah. Okay, but so, but what I think I and I understood Mr. O'Leary's question to be more of a specific plan. My my thought would be, and I, I haven't read anything about distribution yet either. That assuming it's going to go to our first first responders, first our frontline workers, first our healthcare workers, first because they're the ones that are interacting and then presumably or hopefully the rest of the individuals like you know the, the people here that are working are interfacing with the general public on a regular basis you know which would be the health you know probably the health officials and and so on and so forth but i i think we wanted to maybe have our own our own plan ready for that distribution if possible. And, and madam chair can add one other thing that might be useful for us I sh i'm sorry miss i apologize for cutting you off i thought you were <laughs> no no that's fine so what's it what's important too is this moderna's vaccine very different uh, it is much easier to store it can be stored with a conventional only 20 degrees celsius meaning a conventional freezer we can buy at lowe's so the town can prepare but more importantly unlike pfizer's which has a five-day shelf life once you take it out of that extreme temperature Moderna's is going to have 30 days. So I feel that to store something in negative 80 would have been much more expensive. I've seen what that equipment costs. So I feel like these are things that, you know, the Board of Health will probably look into. Again, I'm not the doctor, but if Moderna's, uh, from my understanding, Moderna's, um, and I was briefed by a doctor, a panel of them today from an investment standpoint, Moderna's vaccine is going to be much easier to store and distribute and it's going to cost less. So maybe, maybe that can be something like refrigeration that the town can get ready for. I don't know. I'm just, you know, I'm just trying to give all the information that I read today. It just so happens what was given. Okay. So getting back to the, um, so, and then the letters you're, you want those a little bit of fine tuning on those letters. Correct. Uh, 
and then to have them signed coming from the board as well as the town administrator as well. Yes. You want the, yes. Okay. Similar to the, the prior letters and <laughs> Mr. Gilberto, um, Mr. Gilberto. Thank you. I, I would just note that these are um, letters that multiple communities are signing on to. We have an option to do that. Um, if we want to fine tune the wording, then we would be sending a letter separately from the standardized letter, which is certainly fine, but um, I just wanted to alert you to that. Okay. I think I think doing both would be fine. I think we should sign on with it. as many communities that are gonna sign on so that the letter has as many communities on one letter to all of the delegations. And then if we wanna send our own separate one, again, to me, we just need to continue to speak up and speak our mind and be heard. Cloud it up and let it rain, as they say. So the, the thing is that, that um, we did get responses to, to the entire delegation that we wrote to previously that Mr. Gilberto included. And so they are listening and hopefully they will be. They know the issue. They know it's compelling. But so we'll just, uh, I think we have to, do you want to vote, Mr. Gilberto, to allow us to have you sign and allow the, uh, me to sign? You want to? You want the board to just have consensus? Cons there, there's, a consensus. Qu there's a question, by the way, on the chat, Mr. Gilberto. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry. Well, that was well, let's just, I don't know if that same refrigerator is, is good for this uh, vaccine. It's good for the flu vaccine, I believe. Yes, yeah, so that there is a question from uh, Ms. Dari regarding a refrigerator uh, with, for low temperature storage. And she's actually quoting what he said, which is that it was under lock and key in his office, which is uh, correct. Um, and so, yes, we did acquire, uh, utilizing available funds, um, a, uh, um, a more um, uh, vaccine appropriate storage refrigerator that has been uh, located um, here in the town hall. I don't know whether it meets the standard that Mr. Studo identified, um, nor do I think that it has the storage capacity in terms of the volume based on its size. Um, but we, we have upgraded uh, to uh, the appropriate vaccine level storage, um, not necessarily for COVID-19 related purposes, but for the other vaccines that were required to store as part of our influenza clinics and other, uh, other issues. Um, but uh, it is possible that it will meet at least one of the standards that you've identified, Mrs. Studo. Thank you, Mrs. Okay. Doherty. Ms. Doherty. Okay, Th thank you. And getting back to the business, um, getting back to this, um, this issue with the letter. So by consensus, is that, is that a, um, you're okay with consensus being, we should be signing on and we should be signing on as the town and then sending additional letters in, from the TA and the chair on behalf of the board, and you're okay with that. And then I just wanted to, I, again, I, I mentioned this every meeting, but I just want to thank the school, the superintendent, the school department, because they're up to date to the minute letting us know what's going on, and there have been, you know, little cases here and there that they've alerted us to, but keeping everybody informed, but calm with respect to everything that's going on and I, I appreciate that um, with that the school department is doing that to let people know. Okay, so with no further comment, we can move on to the next order of business, which would be public comment. So if we can have anybody that wishes to speak for public comment, we already uh, answered Ms. Doherty's question and I have Matt, a hand raised by Matt Martin. Mr. Martin. Hi, uh, thank you. So I appreciate um, being able to speak here tonight and appreciate everything the town is doing as part of this pandemic. And I second what Mrs. Uh, Manny Pally says about the school, keeping everyone informed. It's been, it's been great. Um, I live at Five Parsonage Lane and I realize you're a little behind on your agenda, so I'll try to keep this quick. Um, at the end of our town road is some land owned, or sorry, at the end of Parsonage Lane is some land owned by the town, which backs up into a, a large parcel owned by the town, uh, Three Carpenter Drive. And I know before I moved here, folks talked about there being a uh, like a senior housing development going in at the end of the road. 
we noticed, me and my neighbors, just walking through the woods, uh, trying to get outside, that there was some construction activity going on down there. And wanted to see if the select board, um, you know, has an update on any plans for that parcel. Uh, there's been an excavator going through the woods. It looks like they dug some test pits. And just curious, um, you know, as town-owned land, if there's any plans for that in the near future. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Mr. Gilberto. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Martin, thank you very much for your, your inquiry. Um, so uh, the property that, um, that he has identified um, on Parsonage Lane, it's at the uh, dead end of Parsonage Lane. And I think most of the board members know that it does abut the property at the end of Carpenter Drive, the uh, town, which is the town owned land that we have been uh, working uh, with the planning commission um, and uh, two consultants to explore its uh, feasibility for the potential construction of affordable housing. And so uh, you, the board members know, and uh, for you, uh, Mr. Martin, you may or may not know that we did obtain some state grant funding, probably going back almost a year now, to evaluate um, the area for uh, suitability for construction. So what you're seeing there uh, is in fact that the excavators that are participating in the work for test pits, uh, just to understand the uh, a level of percolation for um, potential septic system construction. Um, I know that we've had a couple of conversations about the extent of the, the land to be involved. And I think it's very clear that the land at the end of Carpenter Drive is very much under consideration for this purpose. And there is in fact uh, a previous uh, vote of town meeting for affordable uh, housing construction. A future vote of town meeting would be required to authorize it for a different type of um, construction. Uh, but there's been a big question mark about the specific parcel you've identified, which is sort of uphill, I believe, of that area. Um, and I know that we've had some discussion about not only the concerns for the uh, the neighborhood, the abutters in that area, but also because of the topography of that lot. Um, there's some pretty steep areas on that lot that make it not necessarily desirable. So the status right now is that the focus has been on that Carpenter Drive parcel rather than the Parsonage Drive, the, par the Parsonage Road parcel, because of those factors. Um, you know, I think to be fair, I think to some extent everything has been on the table, but I really think that the focus has been from the elected boards involved for the reasons I just mentioned and also from the, the, the detailed review, it's been on that small, on that parcel uh, on the other side on Carpenter Drive. Uh, but to answer the question for, you know, those who don't know, we, we are aware of the activity, it is authorized activity. Um, you know, we've had some discussions with the abutter, there's only really one direct abutter. Um, who's uh, been impacted on the other side that I know of and they're aware of it. Um, but, um, you know, you are correct that that is the activity that, that you're seeing. And is there a timing or schedule on when the town would make a decision on selling the land? So the, we had, I think, hoped that we would be able to bring a discussion to town meeting um, at the October town meeting. And I think we realized pretty quickly through the discussions that the select board had that um, both the, the limitations on being able to have citizen engagement because of COVID, as well as um, the, the fact that there was much more due diligence to be done, to be done like what you're seeing out there right now. I, we, the article was pushed off from town meeting. I, I think that the, the working plan is for some discussions to be taking place in the first and second quarter of next year. So first half of 2020 with a, a goal of potentially asking town meeting to take action in June of 2020. Okay, does that answer Mr. Martin? Mr. Martin, does that answer everything? We I, should be. Oh, so I guess who, like, how does one stay informed on what's gonna happen there? Sure, so um, you could reach out to the planning uh, commission the Community Planning Commission or the Planning Department, the town planner is overseeing the project, uh, but the select board has very much been involved and is aware of, of you know, what the intention is there. Um, you know, and again, just to stress the phase that we're at, we're really trying to learn more about what the potential might be for that Carpenter Drive parcel. Um, I think it's fair to say that no decisions have been made regarding development actually occurring because I think there's a lot of factors, how much could be built there and what impact to the area. Um, what type of uh, market is there to do this construction? Um, but if you if you reach out to Danielle McKnight, she is the town planner. She uh, would be the best person to kind of give you a, a more detailed update on it. 
Great. And I think, you know, Madam Chair, through you, we could also put this on for an agenda item, I think probably in January to give an update to the community as well. Okay. That sounds like a good idea. And this is that parcel that we have discussed in previous board meetings, which was um, from, from years ago was supposed to be used to create senior housing. So when you're saying affordable housing, I, I'm sorry, that, I misspoke. That's somewhat of a dirty word around here, even though it really isn't. But you know that is affordable housing in terms of senior housing is what that parcel was originally intended for. But that fell through years ago, from my understanding and talking about it with the board in previous meetings. Thank you, Madam Chair. That's a very important clarification. The board has on multiple occasions identified that parcel for senior housing. That's correct. Yes, right, right. Um, okay, so I think we'll make sure that Mr. Mr. Martin gets some information and we have your address too, so we'd be able to maybe reach out when it does come up. Um, and our agendas are posted, so we can also just check out the website, check out the, the agenda for our meetings. And also that's another way to, to know when it's, if and when it's coming up. So thank you for uh, joining us and, and keeping it short. <laughs> you know, you don't have to. All right. Is there anyone else that has a um, comment? Let me see. I see no other hands, Mr. Gil, Mr. Gilberto. Okay. All right, so we can move on to our next order of business, which is board member reports. And we uh, we have we'll, I'm sorry, excuse me. We do have a we do have a 7:15, so we're a little bit behind on that. But let's move, let's let's get through board member reports, Mr. Studo. Um. So well, it's been quiet uh, on the front for. CPC and ZBA. However, we do have a meeting tomorrow for the Economic uh, Development Committee. And um, so I'll have something, I'll have more on the net for our next meeting there. Um, and then there was a discussion today about the water main, which I'm going to defer to Mr. O'Leary because I really don't want to misspeak. Although I'm, I'm almost caught up. I mean, between him and the TA's help, I'm, I'm, I'm getting there. Uh, about that complex process, but you know, he's uh, been dealing with it more. So I'll, I'll leave it to him. Sorry, Steve. Hope you don't <laughs> mind. And, um, and no other, other than that, uh, again, just going through the appointments, paperwork and yeah, that's, that's about it right now. Right. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Studio. Mr. O'Leary, we'll segue over to you. Okay. Uh, just related to, uh, related to the water. Um, as you're aware, the board was informed a few weeks ago that we're um, moving forward with the uh, awarding of bids for the water main projects from the Tower Hill Tower again, to Main Street, cross North Street, and then another portion also. What we're also looking at and charge the um, consultants with is to take a look at within the appropriations, you know, what can we do to facilitate part of the plan as we talked about doing uh, Upper Main Street. So between uh, North Street and Burroughs Road. So uh, the consultants are going to be doing their engineering work, which is money's already been appropriated for that, just to give us an idea. And we're probably going to be coming back to the board um, later, at a later date, to uh, look for an additional appropriation through the capital plan uh, for June in order to go back out to bid on that. But the, the board's going to get a, a major um, update on water and sewer uh, at our next meeting. It's going to be on the agenda. Uh, so we'll uh, you'll get a more comprehensive uh, briefing from uh, water superintendent uh, consultants uh, the next meeting. That's great. Okay. Thanks. And, as far, and again, as far as the board of health, uh, again, we've uh, yeah. been meeting on a regular basis and uh, have an awful lot to talk about. Obviously, uh, you know, increase in uh, in cases, uh, contract uh, contact tracing is taking place. Um, a lot of the town administrator, he signed a contract with this intern, which he alluded to earlier, who's going to be terrific, uh, which is wonderful that uh, Mary Samos was able to facilitate uh, our getting this individual to assist us, uh, she's a PhD candidate. And uh, Michael, if you want to just uh, elaborate as to what her mission is going to be in the next eight weeks or so, I guess. So she, she um, initially came on as a potential um, 
clinical referral. And I think the, I know that the public health nurse and the health director spoke and felt that, you know, we could really use the uh, assistance in trying to, to coordinate our emergency um, dispensing plan with the plan being outlined by the state specific to COVID-19. And um, she was very, uh, very eager to, to step in in whatever role we needed. Um, strikes me as seasoned in terms of having had experience in some other areas and in, in other states. Um, I think she has roots up in Maine, if I remember correctly, Mr. O'Leary. Correct, yeah. So um, she's actually located out of state, but is able to do the work virtually, which uh, is great and um, is ready and raring to go, um, I believe in December um, for, um, for the remainder of this year. And the timing just works out particularly well for us in terms of, um, you know, needing that, that type of her type of assistance with uh, getting that dispensing planning done. And to the point that I know was brought up earlier, again, it's, you know, we're, we're sort of making some assumptions that the supply of the vaccine will be there. It's a more a matter of, okay, how do we get it into the hands of where it needs to get to and, you know, what role will town government play versus the other parts of the health network that are out there. So um, we look forward to that. And, you know, I know Mr. O'Leary mentioned it, but um, Mary Samos, who has been um, really um, working alongside the Board of Health for uh, the better part, of, well, more than a year now at this point, um, identified and really pushed to make sure this resource was available to us. Thank you. And, and Madam Chair, just as a correction, I said Tower Hill, I meant Moose Hill. Moose Hill on North Street, uh, Water Main, coming from the Moose Hill, not Tower Hill. Oh, see, I had a whole different area of the town. And yeah, I, yeah, right up behind you. But uh, yeah, so yeah. Was, but those those contracts are going to be let and signed and going to be underway, which is great. And again, the uh, the, the contracts, uh, the bids came in uh, lower than anticipated, which was good. A refreshing surprise. Yes. Okay. <laughs> which, uh, which is why we want to move forward potentially on on the upper part of Main Street because it appears as though this may be an advantageous time to to bid. Great. All right, thank you, Mr. O'Leary. Mr. Walner. Yes, uh, two things. One is, uh, as we discussed during last meeting, Michael, uh, Town Administrator, Bill Hertz from the Land Utilization Committee, who's doing the bike trails and myself got together. We signed off on the contracts we approved uh, just a short while ago. So Bill's back on track and he'll continue to make progress uh, in a very important project for the town. So thank you, Michael, for making yourself available. <laughs> middle of all these other things that are going on. Appreciate it. It was good to get that going again. Um, second thing was the age friendly uh, work we're doing with the UMass Gerontology. We ended up with almost a 30% return rate in all the surveys from 5,000 people that we sent it out to. So that's great results. We, um, I believe all the key informants, but one have been interviewed in town. And this week is focus groups, which is about 45 people. 15 from seniors, 15 from rising seniors, and 15 from stakeholders in town. So we're moving really quick to get all the data in as fast as we can. And a few, few of the people who are attending tonight are a part of that group. So uh, looking forward to having UMass Gerontology come back with some concise reports, not only on reaffirming what elder services needs, but also considering the rising seniors, what adults need to stay in town and stay committed to their town. Uh, for the rest of their lives. And that's kind of the main point of this whole effort. So um, that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Twala. Mrs. Gonzalez, anything? Yes. Um, as liaison to Representative Brad Jones and Senator Tarr, I want to congratulate them on their reelections. We're very fortunate to have them. And on that note, um, Representative Jones, Senator Tarr, and Linda Jones and Mary Prenny from the Council of Aging have put together um, an opportunity to be able to have our senior citizen Thanksgiving dinner in a different way this year. Um, very inventive. Uh, it's going to be a drive through Sunday, the Sunday, the 22nd at the Hillview from 12 to 1.30. Um, there's a phone number, 978-664-5600 to register. Um, and you're going to drive through and there will be, um, they will be there and other people will be there and be handing a tote full of Thanksgiving treats to our seniors. So just wanted to get that out there. And if everybody could bring an item for the food pantry. 
That's excellent. Okay, thank you. Thank you to the members. And uh, I, we are a little behind on calling the 715 public hearing. So we'll do the, move on to the next order of business, which is the public hearing on Reading Lumber uh, Flammable Storage License. So, do we have a representative of Reading Lumber in attendance? Madam Chair, I believe there's a hearing notice. I don't know if we want to read that. Yes, we do, and I'm scrolling, <laughs> scrolling down to it. Uh, I'm scrolling as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's a notice of. If I'll, I'll just go ahead and read it because I found it first. It's a notice of <laughs> virtual public hearing in accordance with Chapter 148, Section 13 of the Massachusetts General Laws and Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. A virtual public hearing will be held by the Select Board on Monday, November 16, 2020 at 7.15 p.m. on the application of Reading Lumber. For a license for the above ground storage of 4,500 gallons of flammable and combustible gases at 110 Main Street in North Reading. Please note that the previously advertised amount of 4,240 gallons has been corrected to 4,500 gallons. And this is a virtual meeting to be attended um, via internet via telephone with the links, the web and Zoom and phone links that have been uh, placed on the meeting notice and as advertised and it's by the select board. On, also in our packet is um, the Deputy Fire Chief Barry Galvin's, um, Barry, Galvin's notifica Barry Galvin's notification to the select board, which it's in the packet. I don't know if you want that right into the record. Um, but actually, we have we have our member from the fire department joining us. We so, do. and then do we have anyone from Reading Lumber joining us? Do we do we not have anyone in attendance from Reading Lumber? I do not see anybody here. Um, the applicant name uh, was listed as Charles Strout on behalf of Reading Lumber, but I do mm -hmm. I don't see anybody. Um, identifying as that person or on their behalf. Um, as you mentioned, the deputy chief is here. Um, he has been facilitating this process and he did provide a written report as well as obtain a, um, a, a map that showed the location as well. And I, if you'd like, I'm sure he can speak to the detail of what's being applied for. Well, don't we need to hear from the applicant? Just I think that would be ideal. The applicant yeah. knew this was on the, on the agenda, right? Uh, they, they facilitated the mailing of um, the notices, so I would believe so, yes. There's about a notification that they had to handle, which they did um, last week, I believe, or two weeks ago. So do we have anyone in attendance on behalf of Reading Lumber? Do you think it could be someone on the phone that just might need to unmute Mr. Gilberto? Uh, the, the only um, phone participant, it looks like, is, I, I believe, um, the local paper, I think. Okay. I can briefly unmute all and see if that if anyone speaks up if you'd like madam chair sure Is there anyone here? Is Mr. Mr. Strout here or anyone from Reading Lumber to speak on your application? Okay. Okay, what's the, what's the board's pleasure? We don't even have the applicant here. So what is the board's pleasure? Um, this is, to my recollection, the first one of these that I've seen. Mr. O'Leary. It, it seems to be a tr pretty straightforward application, and uh, I think the um, deputy chief's letter outlines the reasons for it. Pretty straightforward, you know, unless uh, someone 
the abutters have some strong reaction, adverse reaction to it, I have no problem with uh, with moving forward uh, with it. But I, I wait to see if there's anybody in the public who has uh, has any comments. Otherwise, it's pretty straightforward. They're just looking to basically double their capacity for their propane tanks so they can service their customers. And uh, unless there's objections from neighbors and from the fire department, which there doesn't appear to be, uh, it's pretty straightforward. I have no problem taking action on it. But I do want to hear from any about us or concerned citizens if there are any. So, so you you don't you don't mind that the applicants not here? You just want to move forward on that? Yeah, I, I don't I don't mind that they're not here again. It's it's pretty straightforward. Okay, um, Mr. Waller, are you in agreement that we should move forward? Yeah, you're fine. I just want to hear. You know, obviously, if there's any safety issues or neighbor concerns, right. the only okay. thing I well. Mr. Studo, are you all set with moving forward? Yeah, I, I'm trying to see. I read. Yeah, it looks pretty straightforward, uh, unless something comes up. But okay. And um, Mrs. Gonzalez, are you okay with moving forward? I am. After here. Right. Thank you. Okay. So before Excuse we me? we we oh. Patricia. Hi. Um, I'm in the neighborhood just behind Reading Lumber. So my property does abut the Patricia, property. Patricia, I'm going to call for anyone that wants to speak on this, anyone that wants to give comment. But before I do that, we're going to, when I call for that, I'm going to call for your full name and your address. But before I do that, I want to just, let's just hear from, we have our representative from the fire department since we're moving forward on the application. Um, and and probably we, we don't have the applicant here to explain it, but but we do have our, our um, fire department here to explain it. If you don't. Okay, very good, thank you. And then we're gonna call to, we're gonna call for anyone that wants to speak in favor or against it okay. and that, open that portion of the hearing up, okay? Okay, very good, thank you. All right, so welcome to our, to our representative from the fire department. If you don't mind unmuting and letting everyone know who you are. I'm Deputy Chief Barry Galvin, uh, Fire Prevention Officer for the North Reading Fire Department. Thanks for hanging in there all this time for this, for okay. until we got to this. All right, so go ahead. You you gave us a report. So um, first, I'll mention there's a I see a name in the chat here, Madalena. I was dealing with someone oh, thank with you. that name from Devony Energy, who was um, they're the uh, the contractor for Reading Lumber for the propane. So I don't know if she's wants to speak on behalf of Devony Energy. I don't I don't actually see anyone in the chat room, but if okay. you don't mind just giving us a brief rundown of your if, a summary of your your report was pretty specific, but if you don't mind for purposes of the public hearing giving a rundown, that would be great. So Massachusetts general law and the fire code requires any storage of propane greater than uh, two thousand gallons to have a license from the local licensing authority, which is why we're here tonight. Um, my understanding is that Devony Energy, who is the propane supplier for Reading Lumber, uh, would like to store two additional uh, 1,000 gallon propane tanks. So they would have a total of four uh, for filling cylinders. Um, so they have applied for the license. The cylinder, the two additional cylinders are going to be in the same uh, caged and enclosed area. I've asked them under the fire code to. Uh, protect the entire area with bollard protection. And other than that, I, I think that one of the main reasons is they don't want to make so many trips they have filling, which I think it actually ends up being safe because we don't really see too many incidents involving propane filling stations, but um, those few that happen are more likely to happen during a filling operation, I believe. So I think it's safer actually to allow them to fill less down there. Um, in addition to the four tanks, they have two 120-gallon tanks up against the building that heat the building, and they have several small, uh, I want to say about 30-pound tanks for the forklifts. So that's why they had to increase um, the license to, to uh, equal 4,500 gallons to uh, account for the rest of the propane that they use on the property. Um, so this. NFPA 58 governs uh, liquefied petroleum, natural uh, liquefied petroleum gas, LP gas, or propane, and that's by a code 527 CMI chapter 69. Uh, 
regulates things like uh, distance from buildings, um, emergency shutoffs, uh, thermal protection, things like that. So as long as they follow the code and, and we'll be doing an inspection down there on the installation and you know making sure each year the permit is renewed so we show that trade is an inspection for the fire prevention. So we'll be uh, performing that. Thank you. And just for the board's edification, there, ha there haven't been any incidents or issues there with what's currently in existence, right? No. no. And do the members have any questions? None. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for that. All right. So now we'll, we'll um, and I know you said Devaney, but I don't know if there's anyone from Devaney here, but you pretty much explained it. And it's to reduce the, you know, reduce the number of times they have to refill, obviously, with the bigger capacity. So is there anyone, and Patricia, I know we'll start with Patricia, but if anyone would like to speak in favor or against this application, if you could unmute yourself. And Patricia, if you're still with us, if you could please state your name and your address um, for our recording clerk. And then... We're going to start with you, Patricia. Okay. Um, hi. So it's hi. Patricia Elliott. Hi, Katie. <laughs> um, and I'm at 3 Leland Road Extension. Okay. Yeah. And, and what would you like to tell the board? With so I would just, um, you know, wanted to participate just to get some more information because there's wetlands between my property and North Reading Lumber. Um, but we are, you know, connected. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that the fire chief and everyone um, felt it was safe. Um, I know that there's a couple outbuildings there and just in preparation for the meeting, I just tried to, you know, learn a little bit about um, storage of propane. <laughs> and it did say um, that there had to be a distance of 25 feet for any storage that's um, beyond a thousand. So I'm just wondering, it seems that my understanding of when I go back there to get my own personal propane tanks filled um, for the grill, that it is pretty close to the buildings. So um, that was my only concern. And just of course, to see if um, you know, there was approval of the town and the, the fire department of the safety of it. Okay. De Deputy Chief Calvin, do you is there do you think you could answer that question? I can. I personally measured it and it's greater than twenty five feet. And it is in compliance with the requirements. Yes. Okay. All right. Patricia, does that answer your question? Okay, so it is. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Is there anyone else here that would like to speak in favor or in opposition to the application i am seeing none and i am hearing none mr gilberta do you see anyone okay seeing none and hearing none we'll close that portion of the public hearing and to the board do we have a motion do we have any further discussion can i ask a question this is maureen from the transcript Ms. Mo I'm sorry. I didn't. I didn't respond quick enough before you called. Oh, for that's okay. Time. Well, we'll just we'll reopen that portion of the <laughs> that we just closed. Go ahead. I, I just want to know how far apart each bollard is going to be that protects each of these tanks. Um, it, there's no distance listed on the hand drawn map that's in the packet. So the code reads um, no more than four feet apart. Thank you. They're buried three feet into the ground and they're four inches in diameter. Okay, thank you. Okay, is there, and is there anyone else that would like to speak in favor, in opposition, or have any questions with regard to this application? Seeing none, we'll close that portion of the hearing and also for the members of the public. And this was probably 
added by our um, by Deputy Chief Galvin that it's under the specific um, requirements. It's conditioned upon compliance with the laws and the codes and the regulations. Um, and that it's really spe specifies that there's no capacity beyond what the license capacity permits. No storage capacity beyond that, which is what's, what was reviewed, inspected, approved, measured, and um, permitted. So do I have a motion? Mr. Studo, you're also muted. Thank Sorry. You. Madam okay. Chair, I move to grant a license for storage of liquid propane for a total of 4,500 gallons to be located at Reading Lumber, 110 Main Street. Second. Okay, I have a motion by Mr. Studo, a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Manu Pelli is aye. Um, and thanks again, Deputy Chief, for hanging in there and <laughs> waiting. So now we can move on to our, our next, thank you, our next yeah, public hearing scheduled for 7.30. We're slight, a little slightly late. And that is the uh, public hearing on the fiscal year 2021 tax classification. And we, we have Ms. Carboni with us. Mr. Gilberto, did, we're, we're going to proceed. Mr. Gilberto gave us a quick update with respect to a little technical glitches that we're having. But we had hoped to proceed anyway. And you are here and we thank you for hanging in there too. We, we had hoped to proceed with as much information as can be provided to the board with regard to this agenda item for the public hearing tonight. With the understanding that we may have, we may have to open but continue the public hearing um, to a, a later meeting. Mr. Gilberto. Thank you, that, that's correct, Madam Chair. Um, and I, I don't know at what point you'd like the, uh, the hearing notice to be read um, as well, um, but We've got a presentation that has been uploaded just now to the um, share file folder. Um, I, the assessor and the finance director have their, done their best, I believe, to update that presentation to reflect the information that's available to us. Um, as most of the board members know, we are required to uh, work through a um, Commonwealth of Massachusetts Department of Revenue online um, reporting system that also does the calculations related to um, the final calculation of the tax rate. And so we generally will utilize that system to come up with projections that we review at this hearing um, with the board uh, to aid in any decision making that you may, um, yeah, you'll choose, that you choose to make this evening relative to potentially classifying the tax rate and or taking advantage or not taking advantage of certain exemptions and other tax related matters. Um, the board does not set the tax rate. That is something that's ultimately done by the Board of Assessors in conjunction with this Department of Revenue formula, but it does as a matter of custom make a recommendation at the conclusion of the tax classification hearing. Um, some of the board members know that today we were um, resolving uh, a final um, question of how to classify one piece of the um, the overall operating budget of the town from the June town meeting. Um, we resolved that question, I'm told by the finance director this afternoon, uh, only to find out that that online software that's so important in coming up with the calculation um, was not functioning properly uh, this afternoon. So the work that we would generally do with that software system to give you projections um, ended up ultimately being impeded. And while the extent of the implication might only be in the, the magnitude of um, a few pennies, honestly, in terms of the, the tax rate. Um, you know, we're, we're just apprehensive to put out there too much information that's not checked and balanced through the state reporting system. And it's made a little more complicated by the unique situation we're in this year where we've elected to really play it conservatively with our budget. We've, um, we've got the benefit of some significant increase in, in state aid from our projections, but we're electing not to 
um, expand that. And that will require some work on the part of the finance director to sort of balance out our overall tax recapitulation sheet. So those created some, um, when I say last minute, you all know you heard from me about an hour before the meeting, last minute surprises. Um, I talked with the chair um, and I, I think we felt that there was quite a bit of information we could present for discussion this evening. And depending upon the board's pleasure, it, it could opt to, to act. Um, and if it felt it needed more information, then you do have the option to continue the hearing um, to uh, another date. And so I have uploaded into share file a presentation um, that the finance director and the um, uh, assessor worked on. You'll recognize the format, but you'll also see that there are some references to previous fiscal year information in it as well. Um, and so I, I think, Madam Chair, I don't know if we want to stop there and sort of just gauge the intent or desire of the board members. Yes, I do, because I, if, if the board wants to move forward, then I'd want to read the, read the notice of hearing into the record. So, um, Mr. O'Leary? Well, further, we're going to have to, even if we're going to continue the hearing, we're going to start it and then continue it, I would assume. Right, right. Um, or if, yes, I think there's a, there is enough information for the board to, at least here now, we have, you know, we have our finance team here to be able to present um, what they can now that it was just an unforeseen computer glitch. And you know how Liz wants to be very, very specific about numbers and as specific as she can. So, mm -hmm. but I think it would be, I think it would be best to move forward if that's the board's pleasure. Otherwise we can not go into the hearing and then pick a different date to, you know, re-advertise and hold the, hold the public hearing once that glitch works itself. Works itself can, I, can I ask the town administrator, have you got advice from council as to whether or not we could open the hearing, hear all the information, and then vote at a future with the next meeting? So I, I have not, but I believe from talking with the chair, you know, that we would keep the hearing open. If we do open it, I, I actually think you, unless you want to trigger re-advertising, I think you, you probably have to open the hearing right. and right. continue it. Um, Madam Chair, I know we didn't talk about that detail, but that would, that would be my, my right. understanding. We would open it, you know, even if just to continue it. Um, because I, I, there may be information that the board members of the public wish to see more, you know, I'm not going to say final because the numbers are never final when we're at this stage, but more updated or more accurate information. Right. And I think we might have questions on what, what you do have to present. We may be comfortable moving forward, voting on a recommendation. We have Lisa Egan joining us as well. She typically addresses the board annually during this public hearing as well on behalf of the business community in terms of the um, tax classification. So I think we can move forward, but I'd, I'd want to know if that that's what, you know, the rest of the members want. Otherwise we would, you know, postpone this, postpone this public hearing to set up another meeting. So what's your pleasure, Mr. O'Leary? I'm, I'm just okay, going to poll okay. the members as to what they'd like yeah, to. I'm okay with moving forward and then voting at a few days, taking a final vote. Okay. Thanks, Mr. O'Leary. Mr. Walmer, um, move, ready to move forward? Yes. All right. Um, Mrs. Gonzalez? Look forward. Okay, Mr. Studo? All right, so let's just open the public hearing and, and we'll, we'll hear from our finance team. And this is a notice of uh, Town of North Reading Select Board notice of virtual public hearing on property tax classification. The Select Board will hold a virtual public hearing on Monday, November 16, 2020 at 7.30 p.m. to determine the percentage of the local tax levy to be borne by each class of real and personal property for fiscal year 2021 in accordance with the provisions of Chapter 40, Section 56 of the Massachusetts General Laws. This hearing will be conducted virtually as authorized by Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. Interested taxpayers are encouraged to present oral testimony at this virtual hearing or may submit information in or comment in writing to the select board via U.S. mail to town hall. 235 North Street, North Reading, Mass 01864, or via email to town administrator at northreadingmass.gov, no later than 12 noon on Thursday, November 12, 2020, which has already passed. 
The meeting may be accessed as follows. It provides the internet, the Zoom link, the internet, Zoom link, the mobile telephone numbers, dial by location numbers, meeting ID and passcode, and um, that's by the select board. So we have Ms. Carbone joining us and we have our finance director joining us. If you wanna take it away, and is Liz gonna be sharing the screen? Yes. Okay. It's, uh, Madam Chair, before we proceed, I uh, need to uh, make a disclosure. Sorry, Mr. Go ahead, Mr. Holder. I'm sorry. Go ahead. All right. You know, as, is, as I have in years past, uh, I disclose that uh, because I have other family members who live in the community who own uh, commercial property, um, I may have to recuse myself from the discussion and participation in the vote unless there's a recommendation to provide a single tax rate, which is what I believe is going to be presented. So I will be um, participating only unless and until uh, a recommendation of a single tax rate uh, is proposed. But again, I have a family member who lives in town that owns commercial property, and therefore under the regulations, I have to disclose that. So okay. please let the record show. Thank you, Mr. O'Leary. Thank you. All right. Okay. Okay, Ms. Carbone. I believe Rich had a question. Yeah, I didn't. I, I should just point out my wife owns a uh, uh, condo, office condo in town as well. So I guess I'll be following Steve's uh, lead here. Just so you know. Thanks, Mr. Walner. Anybody else? <laughs> <laughs> All right, go ahead. So thank you for holding this classification hearing and to chime in on what Mike said, yes, it was a very unfortunate situation. I can tell you Gateway, which is our electronic filing for our revenues and our expenditures goes down all the time this time of year. And I believe it's because of so many communities are doing the same thing we're doing. We're throwing those numbers in there. Uh, with that being said, Gateway has also had a lot of upgrading done in the beginning of the year. So we will get to the bottom of it. I did, I do have a phone call out there and I also have um, an email and they're real good at responding. So I, I'm not worried about that. My hope is that it, you know, we'll have it resolved tomorrow. But that being said, the classification hearing, the select board's role is to select the selection of a minimum residential factor. So that's, you have your percentage of residential, your percentage of commercial, industrial, and personal property, also known as CIP. You will hear me um, call it that. You also have to take a vote on an open space discount. The third vote is granting of a residential exemption. We will go through a slide on that. The fourth and final vote is the granting of a small commercial exemption. So the percentages that I'm showing you on this, on this screen right here is the fiscal 2021 value. Those are, those have been certified. They're, they're, they've already gone through the Department of Revenue. So the residential percentage of the tax levy for fiscal 21 is 87.59%. And that's up from last year, it was 87.49. So we're, we're, or 47, I'm sorry. Um, we are increasing in our residential side, whereas our commercial, industrial, and personal property is 12.41% of that levy. 
So the total tax levy, if you follow it down, I do keep the years just so that we can see the increase in the valuations. And it gives you the projection whether we're, you know, whether the values are declining or, or increasing. And it, it's very clear that we continually increase by at least a million every year. So we're, we're in good shape value-wise. What is a split or dual tax rate? <clears throat> Excuse me. The select board is the deciding um, person to decide whether the tax rate is split between residential, commercial, industrial, and personal property. The statute allows an increase in the CIP share of the tax levy up to 50% higher than the residential. It does not generate new revenue or additional revenue. It reallocates the, value, the tax revenue we're going to receive. The only years um, that the town has ever split the rate was in 1985 and in 1988, and then resumed back to the single tax rate in 1986 and 1989. The single families, we, we have 4,288 of those this year. We did bring on 10 new homes this year. Eight of them were teardowns and rebuilt. So in other words, the, the properties that were selling for around 500, five, 600,000, the contractors were going in there, tearing them down, rebuilding new homes and selling them for the eight, nine and higher. Uh, but we did bring on in the new growth, the 615, 632. The condos, we had 805, Last year, this year, we have 857, 50 of those being pulpy homes. Um, the rest of the, the mixed use, that always hovers around 23. And the residential vacant land, that's some that's buildable, that's also unbuildable land. You have 208 parcels of that. And of course, our vacant land will fluctuate with our new houses that are being built too. So for the first vote on the open space, we do not have any classified open space for the town of North Reading. The open space is anything that's not taxable we tax all of our parcels. I don't believe North Reading's ever had an open space parcel. The residential exemption is a vote that the board, select board must take and you can shift up to 20% of the levy from your middle value homes to your lower homes that will get the reduction and your higher valued homes will get the increase. It's, it's a mathematical equation that it, it just shifts the levy. We're not gaining any more money. We're only shifting the, val the values on the tax. This is a scenario if you were to consider shifting at a 10%. So in the middle, our value for our average single family value home 
for 2021 is 615,632. Last year it was 601. So we've increased by 14,000 just in the revenues. And here you can see we did, we did have to use last year's tax rate, but the methodology is still the same. If you take the middle column being the, the average home, the savings is, is shown here saving $804. That $804 is going to shift to the higher end homes. The 15%, it's, it's the same thing, just at 15%. And then the 20%, that is the maximum that you can shift, is the 20%. The small commercial exemption works very much the same way as the residential exemption. With, with the exception that there are certain eligible parcels that, that could uh, be included in this. We do receive a list from the Department of Unemployment and we go through that list to find out how many, how many of our commercial industrial properties are less than a million dollars with fewer than 10 employees. That is the criteria that has to qualify for this exemption. We had 67, um, we had 67 uh, commercial properties that would qualify. And we have 226, so. The select board may shift the town's tax burden from the residential class to the commercial, industrial, personal property, as long as the shift does not exceed the minimum residential factor. The 87.59% is the percent of the residential levy that is born. The 12.41 is for the CIP. The Board of Assessors at this time recommends a factor of one or a remaining single tax rate. This is just the graph to show you the, the percentages by the classes. This, this graph will just show you if you were to consider shifting the rate. We did it for 10% and 25%. And again, we're not raising any more taxes, we're only shifting it. Um, if, if you look down on the valuations, that, and my, my slide over here, on the far left, that should say residential up at the top for the 3,081 and then commercial for 232, 146 is industrial, 57 million is your personal property um, revenue. And if you follow that over just with the percent changes, it'll show you how the percentage will change per the class. So if we were to shift 10%, the tax rate could be um, 1760, the commercial, no 1560 and the commercial rate would jump up to 1716 and your industrial and personal property would follow the same rate. This is just another scenario 
giving you the same data, but following it through a few years. Um, and it does show the tax rates and where the tax rates have gone from 2017 to 2020, because we are using the fiscal 20 tax rate. Do you have any questions so far? Okay, Mr. Kinsler, will there be any questions? I'm fine, thank you. Ms. Ms. Gonzalez, any questions? Nope. Mr. Walner, any questions? I'm good. Thank you. Mr. Studo, any questions? All set? Okay. Okay, so um, to just to, re to recap, you, I know a few slides back, you said that it's a um, recommendation, just to summarize, not to speak not to split the classification factor of, factor of one you said single tax rate and the tax rate you said we're using was the 1560 but that's just for this presentation exactly and if we look at where the values increased as as the town administrator alluded to earlier in the presentation or opening of the meeting. I don't really anticipate the tax rate going much, a few cents one way, a few cents another way. And I, I'm the same with as Liz is. I would be very apprehensive to say that I think it's going to be 1661 or 1559 or 1662 until we can get these numbers through the gateway and you know come up with that number but our 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 values are very strong and our revenues are conservative so okay so right now that's the the problem is that you're unable to to give us the tax rate yet for us to vote on a recommendation on it. However, your presentation and what you just answered suggests that it's not going to be wildly fluctuating from what we have seen historically, from what we've recommended historically over the past five years. I think that was on, on your 13. All right, that, that one year, if if we could go back, I believe Liz, it's um, oh, 11. Yeah, I th it should be further down. No, it should be 14 or 15. Right there. For, right there. So if if you look in 2018 when we went from 1613 in in 2017 to 1634 in fiscal 2018, that's when we began the um the the bond for the school so that was your big increase in that year if you look through 1920 it only changed two cents okay Madam I Chair, was, sorry i did um were you all set miss carbon i'm all set thank you Ms. Rohr, I know you wanted to add something to that. Yes, if I may, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to note that um, uh, according to state statute and uh, the Department of Revenue, um, the select board's role is to only take specific votes. Um, that you do not vote uh, or your vote in the past on on the estimated tax rate is not counted or or needed by the Department of Revenue, just so everybody is aware of that. So, um, and previously, as we, you know, some of us know, and as we just heard in the presentation, we don't have an open space discount, but we have to annually vote on that. Um, we don't have a residential exemption and we haven't split the tax rate. 
And those are the types of things that you are looking for our recommendation and for which we're, we hold these public hearings to hear from, um, to hear from our team, but also to hear from members of the public. Okay, so if there are no other questions from the members, I'm going to um, ask for anyone in attendance, if there's anyone that has, anyone that's attending this hearing, that wishes to speak uh, in favor, against, or provide comment. And I know uh, Lisa Egan, she typically does address the board. Um, and I, I do see that she's joined us. If you wanna, if you wanna unmute Mrs. Egan and speak. <laughs> Welcome. Hi. Might as well kick it off with you if you don't mind stating your name and address and Give of us course, your not at all. I'm Lisa Egan. I live at 8 Oak Ridge Road in Reading, and I'm here as I am the director of the Reading and North Reading Chamber of Commerce. So I, I know we had spoken via email a couple of weeks ago just to get a sense as to where the board might be leaning for the tax rate. And um, as you can imagine, for local business owners, this has been an exceptionally challenging year um, with lots happening and many um, lots of uncertainty. So I would respectfully ask the board to consider maintaining the single tax rate to help support the local business community. North Reading has always been very business friendly and, and to help many of the local businesses who are in triple net leases um, stay afloat. And just for people listening, triple net lease means if the property tax goes up, it gets passed on directly straight through to the tenants. So anyone who's renting in those commercial properties will see an immediate increase in their rents, which inevitably typically gets passed back to the consumer, making it harder to shop locally. So um, I appreciate everyone's consideration and your careful consideration on the matter. And um, just wanted to make the comment on behalf of the community to maintain the single rate. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else that is in attendance that would like to speak in favor, or against, or on any aspect of this? I'm looking, Mr. Gilberto, but seeing no one. Um, Read. Okay. So, um, Madam Chair, I'm just trying to make sure I don't see any hands raised here. Um, okay, yes, Mr. Mr. Gilberto. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so, you know, I mentioned at the beginning that, uh, you know, that we've experienced some challenges, but, um, you know, I do think that the assessor and the finance director have done their best to give us uh, as much of the, the picture as possible. And you, you heard, as I mentioned at the beginning, and as uh, Ms. Carboni indicated here, I think we have a good idea of where things are headed in terms of the only missing piece, which is that that rate. Um, the board has the option um, and I, I believe is authorized to continue with its actions relative to the classification hearing this evening if it so chose. If it wishes to see a, a more finalized projection on the rate, and again, even at, at a future meeting, it will be just a projection subject to approval by the Department of Revenue through the regular uh, tax recapitulation process but we could also bring that information back at a future meeting. It's totally up to the board. Okay. So let me just quickly poll the members. Miss, we do have a number of motions in the packet. So Mr. O'Leary, are you comfortable moving forward with these motions or would you prefer to have the specific? I just have a question on, um, on the tax levy mm -hmm. amount. Are we going to have a number? Is, is with it. Generally, we leave a little bit of money on the table. We don't tax to the max. But I, I haven't heard any number. I, I just see the fifty-four million eight seventy-four. But what? Where are we at? What's the What's the difference here? Madam Chair. Oh yes. Go ahead, Miss Morocco. Um, I I will just address that, and then I saw that. Um, 
the assessor had her hand up as well. So Steve, um, we won't know what the excess levy capacity is until the glitch is fixed within um, DOR's gateway uh, software. So, but j as you just mentioned, um, you know, last year we, there was a $20,000 excess levy capacity. The year before was 16,000. So those are the typical ranges for our excess levy capacity. And are we anticipating a similar range or a yes. larger range because of the uh, revenue anticipated or okay. unanticipated revenue, a little higher than anticipated? Are you speaking to um, the, the local aid? Is that going to impact at all? It, it will, um, but we will stay with our average excess levy capacity. Yes. Madam Chair. Yes, Mr. Gilberto. To Mr. O'Leary's question, could I just ask the finance director to elaborate on terms of the intention for that as to how, how that will be the case? Uh, Mr. Mr. Gilberto, are you referring to how um, the estimated receipts are adjusted to um, a, a, a number that allows for us to have the average the average excess levy capacity is that what you're asking i am yes yes so as everybody is aware um each year and especially um you know uh, those members who have been on um, the financial planning team as well as seeing the revenue plan as we progress through the budget process um what Revenue gets approved at June town meeting for that year, for the next year's operating budget. Those estimated receipts are always adjusted um, during the tax uh, rate setting. So it, those will be adjusted as they normally are, and they will be adjusted to reflect the increase in uh, local aid, Mr. O'Leary. Okay. I'll, I'll ask more questions offline. <laughs> Instead of taking time. Well, I think I don't know that we can. No, I, I'm good. Take take the vote on some of the some of the motions in the packet because they're they're blank. So we can either do it piecemeal and do some of these, if, or we can continue well, hearing until we I, have. I, we heard everybody final. correctly. That particular vote isn't necessary. Is that correct? That is correct. All right. So that's not essential for a tax classification hearing. It's just as a matter of practice, we have been doing that. So Correct. These are, uh, on my screen are um, right. the select board's votes that are necessary in order to submit to the Department of Revenue. So I guess what I'd like to know is, would, do you want to continue this till we have the set figures for those votes, which we do typically do annually? It during this public hearing. Um, but also, I did want to make sure that I, we, we weren't finished with the public comment portion. So look, if, we, if we're going to move forward on piecemeal votes, we should at least hear from anyone else, actually. I, did, I don't know if I closed that, Mr. Gilberto. Did I close that portion? No. I don't believe you did, no. I, don't, I want to know if the board wants to continue this or if you want to do these piecemeal and then come back to this, we always take that vote to make the recommendation. So I understand what our role is, but we also uh, typically with our role, we take those other votes to make recommendations, which are also included in our packet. So, so I guess what I'm asking the members to do is if we can certainly move forward piecemeal and come back to those votes, we can continue this to another hearing date, public hearing date. Um, when we have, when we expect the glitches to be finished and we have complete information to vote on everything, or we can do some and not others. So Mr. O'Leary, those are our options. What would you like? What, I'm, I'm okay with moving forward, closing out the hearing, taking whatever votes are necessary in order to uh, allow the assessors and the administration to get the tax bills out on a timely basis rather than waiting another two weeks and delaying that. So, but that being said, I would like at the next meeting to have these other, this other information presented and we can take whatever symbolic we may want to. 
Okay, so in other words, you have found enough in the presentation to, to make a determination on these other matters. Correct. Pretty straightforward. Okay, Mrs. Gonzalez? I agree. Okay, Mr. Walner? I agree with that. Mr. Studo? Yeah, no, uh, I feel the same way. I think we should just move move on and, and uh, you know, I think we have enough from the presentation. So other than the specific figures, which I agree with Mr. O'Leary, we should hear the, we should get that those figures as soon as they as soon as the glitch is resolved. Um, all right, so Mr. Studo. Madam Chair. Madam Chair. Yes. To establish a tax classification factor of one as recommended by the Board of Assessors. I'm sorry. I called I called for your motion before I closed the hearing <laughs> okay sorry no it's a confusing this this the process a little confusing so i apologize for calling for the motion is there anyone else in attendance which would like to speak in favor which would like to speak against any of this information or would like to comment or question anyone else okay Seeing none, I will close that portion of the public hearing. And now, do I have a motion, Mr. Studo? Yes. Madam Chair, I move to establish a tax classification factor of one as recommended by the Board of Assessors. And so now, because this, if, if we're going to do a classification of one, then Mr. Um, Walner and Mr. O'Leary can participate in this vote. So, do I have a second? I have a motion and a second. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Studo. I have a second by Mrs. Gonzalez. Do I have any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. <coughs> is I, right, Mrs. Gonzalez? Aye. And Manu Pelli is I. And uh, Mr. Studo, ne next motion. Madam Chair, I move not to establish a residential exemption. I have a motion by Mr. Studo. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion by Mr. Studo and a second by Mrs. Gonzalez. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Manu Pelli is aye. Next uh, motion, Mr. Studo. Madam Chair, I move not to establish a commercial exemption. I have a motion by Mr. Studo. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Gonzalez. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Daniel Pelli is aye. So we will come back to the... The next two, right? The next two, yes, correct. When we have... Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. And Mr. Gilberto. Yes, Mr. Gilberto. I do believe that there is one more motion relative to the small commercial exemption, Ms. Carboni. Is that correct? Yeah. That is correct. Uh, it's, it's after the two that are, are blank. I apologize. The ordering is not making it apparent. But okay. um, on page, um, page seven, the last motion. Yeah, I have it. We Can just have to add the word small. Small, correct. It, I just noted it does not say small, so I apologize for that. Okay. And they all, all, they also all read Mr. Chairman. Of course, it would, should be Madam Chair. Yeah, that's all right. Thank you for correcting and covering for me, Mrs. Tudor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're missing the S in that, Mrs. Chair. All right. Do I have? <laughs> <laughs> Madam, Madam Chair, I move to not establish. I've been called worse than Mister, so don't worry about it, Mr. Studer. <laughs> Madam. <laughs> Madam Chair, I move to, uh, to not establish a small commercial exemption. Yeah, all right, I have a motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mrs. Gonzalez. 
And uh, any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. And the chair votes. <clears throat> okay. And now we're finished and we'll hear back on the updated information as soon as you get that um, for us. And then we'll take that up at the next meeting. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Madam Thank Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rohr. Madam Chair. Okay. Yes, Mr. Gilberto. I do want to recognize the work of the assessor and the finance director. I know, you know, it, it, I know the board members have been very patient with us getting this information available, and then we were thrown a curveball late in the day. But, you know, much is the case in many office-based businesses. It, it can be difficult to get information and to communicate with um, outside offices, including with our partners at the state level at times. And, um, you know, they've continued to try to push through to, to get us positioned as, as best they can for this evening's hearing. And while it, it wasn't 100%, it's no, no fault of their own either. Um, and I just, I want to thank them for their hard work and, and for their efforts to present this in a, a helpful way. Thank you. Yes. Thank you to you both. Thank you. Appreciate it. On top of everything else you're doing for us. Thank you. All right, so we're to our eight o'clock uh, show cause hearing on Lucky Mart. And is there a representative from Lucky Mart that's joining us this evening? Anyone? I have a question about that. We got some correspondence, did, didn't we, that they didn't receive the notification or something? Or email? Was she ever this? Mr. Struder, what was your question? Yeah, well, Mr. O'Leary said that they requested a solid email. They requested a postponement because they didn't receive the letter. Mr. Mr. Gilberto, do you want to? Um, do yes. you want? To speak I will. Uh, that? So that that is correct. We received an email from um, Vimal Patel on behalf of Route Twenty Eight slash Lucky Mart. Um, asking um, for a new date for the hearing because as of Thursday, November 12th, he had not received the hearing notice. Um, the notice along with the notice to New England Beverage was mailed um, by a certified mail um, on November 5th um, in accordance with the actions of the select board at its last meeting to schedule the hearing. And uh, for whatever reason, um, there was uh, evidently a delay in delivery when this was brought to our attention on Thursday, we did drop first class copies of the notice um, in the mail to um, the, um, the establishments as well to make them aware. Um, but um, my guess is that, you know, that that also probably took a couple of days for the information to be um, received. Um, you know, we, we, we at, at the suggestion of the chair, we followed up directly with the postal service and we learned some new information regarding um, a term called automation as it relates to mail. And um, I, I, I know what the word automation means. Uh, um, it's not entirely clear to me what it, how, what it means for the mail system, but the long and short of it, is, of it is that it apparently means a letter mailed in North Reading on November 5th now goes to Boston to be automated and then is sent back to North Reading on November 16th for delivery. So, okay. Um, we've not had this issue yeah. in the past. It's the first time this <laughs> has come up. It um, was a request by the licensee who is saying that he didn't receive the notice, but nevertheless still requesting to continue the hearing of the hearing because he still didn't get his notice of the hearing. So he somehow knew enough to ask for the continuance, but. Um, but in any event, what's the board's pleasure, Mr. O'Leary? Uh, I think it's only fair. They probably read about it in the newspaper <laughs> as opposed to getting the correspondence. That is sufficient notice. Mrs. Gonzalez, what's your pleasure? Um, we can continue. Mr. Walner? We have to continue. Mr. Studo? Continue? Automation. Continue. Automation. <laughs> okay. I obviously, I think that the, and from the chair, I obviously think the licensee knew about it. I'm not sure what information is, is going to be presented differently now versus 
whenever we continue the hearing to, but um, if, if, um, if that's my colleague's pleasure to continue it, um, then Mr. Gilberto, can we, should we assign this to our next um, regularly scheduled meeting? Uh, Madam Chair, I do think that that would be appropriate. Uh, we have a hearing scheduled um, for that evening um, already, um, and I would recommend that this hearing be scheduled to uh, be, if it's going to be continued or postponed, to be postponed or continued to December 7th at 8 o'clock p.m. Okay. Just for the record, Madam Chair, I'm in favor of uh, postponing it uh, more for uh, um, coverage for the town for the town rather than the the applicant here, or the the perpetrator, <laughs> the, uh, the the party. Because I think if it's going to be appealed to the ABCC, I think we just need to make sure we have our bases covered. Understood. Thank you. Okay, so December seventh, eight p.m. Okay. All right, and our next order, so we're, I think by consensus have, we'll be rescheduling that. And um, it, I think it, it'd be helpful to uh, maybe, maybe have it delivered to the, to the licensee during their normal hours of business. Um, so that someone who delivers it to them can sign a certificate of service saying it's been delivered, but I'm sure you're gonna communicate back directly to the applicant to via email to let the applicant know that the request was granted and that will be, you know, the hearing will be held. Uh, whatever method you can communicate to him. All of the above, Madam Chair. Yeah, okay, thank you. And our next order of business is a show cause hearing on New England beverage. And do we have representative from New England Beverage? I uh, think I see Mr. Attorney Rudd, sir. Yes, good after, good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, James Rudd, sir, for New England Beverage. Right, and do we have the licensee? The with? licensee, last time I checked, was on, as well as Kevin Lang, okay. someone you'll be hearing from at the next hearing. Okay, so this was scheduled, show cause scheduled for 8.30, and obviously you're here and you've been notified and the licensee has been notified of the hearing, so you don't have any issues with the notification, correct? No, no Madam Chair. Okay. All right, so, um, and we have uh, Chief Murphy's in attendance as well. So uh, in the packet, um, so we're we're gonna open the show cause hearing and we'll hear from we'll hear from you, Attorney Rudzer, in regard to the notice that was issued and the the um, potential violation. Oh um, Madam Chair, members of the, the select board, um, we're not here to challenge the facts. The 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 the, the information prevented uh, the information about the incident is true and we're here. Um, anytime I'm presenting before a board on a sanction for a violation of 138, I, I sort of weigh the facts against um, the following three considerations. One, discipline, rehabilitation, and then deterrence. Um, in terms of, uh, and I'd like to focus uh, my, my comments on rehabilitation because my client uh, is prepared to Incur, and I have some information. I just don't know how to share it with the uh, with the board. Um, but uh, we are going to be in having installed in the premises uh, a system by a company in Medway called ID Science, and apparently it's a computer system that uh, that scans all IDs. Um, the the system, from what I can see from the the the, the order slip includes uh, the ID Science 1000 system complete with Varex ID software, IDS 1000 reader, Microsoft Surface tablet, protective case, 10 inch system tray, and one year subscription to software updates. Um, that system I would, uh, the, the cost of that system is gonna be $4,880.63. Um, so in terms of the rehabilitating the business as a result of this incident, 
I think that that can be addressed by the 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 their use, their their acquisition of such a system, and then using it each and every time. Um, typically speaking, with uh, with deterrence, um, I think that uh, one the public notice that my client is alleged to have violated uh, Chapter One Eighty Three with respect to uh, selling to a minor. Um, uh, the, the local community um, has been put on notice. And certainly it would deter not only specifically as to my client for any future conduct, but then any other uh, licensed establishment uh, to be extra vigilant with respect to underage drinking. Because again, um, a license to sell alcoholic beverages is a, is a privilege. It's not a right. And that's a privilege that has to be exercised responsibly. Um, lastly, I, uh, on the issue of discipline, I would suggest simply the cost of installing and maintaining that system is probably greater um, than a financial sanction that uh, would be imposed as a result of this violation. And so, with that all in, with all of that in mind, I would ask the board to one, you know, find that the violation occurred, and the sanction being the requ the required installation and maintenance and use of this system from ID Science. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Attorney Redzer. We have Chief Murphy here, and Chief Murphy, we've heard from the representative of the licensee to admit, admitting to the fact. So if you wouldn't mind just doing a summary, we do have the reports, they're very detailed reports. If you wouldn't mind summarizing, Chief, what the facts were with regard to this violation. I will, thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, on Sunday, October 18th, um, North Reading Police Detectives, with the assistance of a 20-year-old confidential person, um, had performed alcohol compliance checks throughout the town of North Reading. Um, these checks are done periodically in an effort to reduce the availability of alcohol to people under the age of 21. The checks are done in compliance with the training and guidelines set forth by the ABCC. As part of those guidelines, we notified the public of the compliance checks through electronic and paper media just three days prior to these checks. Prior to the alcohol compliance checks, the underage person was issued all the pertinent paperwork to include the ABCC guidelines. Um, on that Sunday, October 18th, an alcohol compliance check was completed at 160 Main Street, New England Beverage. Um, the next day, I received a report that there was one violation of 204 CMR 2.05, permitting an Ill illegality on the licensed premises. To it, a violation of Mass General Law 138, Section 34, um, sale of an alcoholic beverage to a person under 21. According to Police Detective Mar Michael Mara's report, the underage person was instructed to attempt to purchase a six pack of Bud Light. Um, and the person was instructed to leave the premises if a state identification card was requested by the cashier. The officer monitored the person as they walked into the store. And approximately one minute later, they came out, uh, the person came out with an eight pack of Bud Light aluminum bottles. Um, the officer identified, uh, described the person that had just sold to them. The officers went in the store, identified themselves, and informed the male that was working at the cash register, uh, was identified as Kevin Lang, um, that he had just sold alcohol to a minor. Uh, Mr. Lang responded that the person had looked 21 years old. Um, the detectives asked if the store manager was available, um, and he, Mr. Lang had said he was the only employee on site. Uh, Mr. Lang went on to tell our detectives that he's still in training and that he thought of his tips training um, while he was um, while he had sold the purchase of the alcohol to the minor. Um, a violation notice was issued to the establishment, and Mr. Lang was advised that. Um, the detectives would be following up uh, through my office and I would be notifying the town of the results. Uh, we did do some follow up um, with Mr. Lang uh, through our um, server training program auditor, Amy Luckowitz. On Tuesday, October 20th, she did go there um, and was shown a certificate um, that Mr. Lang did possess. He had a valid certificate of a responsible alcohol server training. Um, so those are some of the facts. Um, one of the things that I had heard prior to a, um, um, the council speaking of the technology, which, which is great, uh, but it all starts with um, human behavior. Um, and in this case, 
you know, the technology wouldn't have worked because he never asked for any ID. So I think it's just important for the board to, um, you know, think of that in their decision. Okay. Okay, so to my colleagues, do you have any questions of either Chief Murphy or Attorney Brad, sir? Mr. O'Leary? Uh, no question, just a comment. I appreciate the uh, license holder coming in and admitting to the sufficient facts and you know, telling us what the remedial action is going to be, and um, that's appreciated, certainly. Uh, but just as a matter of a historical perspective for the uh, licensee, is that it's been a practice of this board to, um, on a first uh, violation as such, to uh, impose a, a three-day suspension, three consecutive day suspension. Uh, the fact that they're offering to put this other um, system in place uh, i believe is to their own best benefit anyway and that of the public but uh, which is great and i think they, they're encouraged to do that but uh, from our standpoint uh, historically we've been very consistent as to the punishment that's been doled out uh, it's been appealed to the abcc multiple times and the abcc has upheld our uh, our decisions because of the consistency that we've shown uh, across the board over the years so just as a, and oh, by the way, uh, you can anticipate uh, three days. At least that's what I would be uh, supporting because I think it's important for the town to be consistent. And I think it's important for the town's decisions to be able to be upheld at the ABCC. Thank you, Mr. O'Leary. Mr. Waller, questions? I, uh, just the only question I have, Michael, was the, um, was the cashier, did he, did he have the tra training certificate valid for the day that the transaction happened? He did. Okay, thank you. No other questions, thank you. Just to clarify, so he had already been TIPS trained before this happened? That's correct. He did not have it with him the night or the day of, um, but we followed up two days later and we were shown a copy of the certificate. Okay, so in other words, everything. despite the TIPS training, he still sold to a minor? Correct. Okay, Mr. Juan, are you all set with your questions? No, I have nothing to add. Steve O'Leary covered the same basis I would have, so thank you. Mr. Studo? All set. Ms. Mrs. Gonzalez? Um, no question, just uh, also a comment that um, I also appreciate that they will be putting this system in, and I, I think that's a good thing, um, but you need an ID to use the system. so. You know, the problem here was they didn't even ask for an ID. So hoping going forward that that becomes a more regular practice, that an ID is in hand to scan onto the screen. Okay, thank you. And uh, just from, from the chair, um, they, they, I think there's a, a plenty of red flags here, not the least of which is we don't, I don't think the licensee has joined us. And the fact is the individual was supposedly on training when this occurred. So there, there was really no oversight if the individual was the only person there and then couldn't provide a manager to um, speak with the, the officers there. And I think that in and of itself is a, is a big problem um, for, the, for the licensee. So, um, and we do, we do have, we have followed this policy all the time, but my one question for Chief Murphy is, have there been any other incidences other than this underage, which is huge for this board, but it, that's a huge problem, but is, have there been any other instances at this location that have been problematic or calls there or anything like that? No, not with this, not with this license holder. Um, and they've been very cooperative with us regarding um, our follow up with the with the alcohol server training as well. Um, you know, they've had minor issues, but they've rectified it within, you know, a short order. Okay, thank you. Okay, so there's, if there's no further questions, I think for purposes of our written decision to the licensee, we're going to, we'll um, take some findings of fact to um, base our decision upon. And, uh, the board wants I can kick it off for us. Uh, we can uh, make a finding of fact that the licensee 
has appeared um, with uh, the licensee's representative, that is, has appeared at this evening's hearing and admitted to the sufficient facts that have occurred um, that include the 10 18 20 compliance check, which had previously been um, publicized, advertised in the transcript, and public notified of the compliance check days in advance, three days in advance. That on 10 18 20, um, that uh, illeg illegality occurred, um, in violation of Mass General Laws, Chapter 138, Section 34 of a sale of alcoholic beverages to an individual under the age of 21. Um, and that the individual that sold to the minor, Kevin Lang, um, was the only employee on site and was, um, when questions, uh, explained that he was in training um, and that in follow up with him, it, he was had been tips trained but sold the alcohol to the underage individual um, in violation of the law despite being tips trained. I don't know if there's anything else to add to it to my uh, mem the members of the board. Well said. That's good. Good enough. Um, okay. And so, do we have a motion to that, please, for the board to consider? Uh, this is my first violation, and I ask the board to take that into consideration as well, please. So, Madam Chair, that's the licensee. That's Mr. Patel, the current. Oh, okay, so the licensee is in, is with. And I thought he was here earlier, and I didn't know whether he got I've disconnected. I've been on since 8 o'clock. I'm sorry. I apologize. My video's not working, but. Okay. All right. So, all right. Well, then we do have the licensee here, which is Sunny Patel is on is, uh, yes. here in attendance with us. And I, we do, we do understand that it's your first violation, and unfortunately, we don't want any violation. So mm -hmm. that isn't really much by way of uh, defense to the matter, especially given the nature of the violation. However, as Mr. O'Leary explained, it, it is a um, we do unfortunately have this with other establishments, and we are measured in our approach and consistent in our approach that this particular type of violation, we typically and traditionally have imposed a three day consecutive three day suspension. So um, unless there's a reason for the members to deviate, that would be the, I think the motion uh, decision and then we would have to fix that, fix that time frame. So do I have a motion? Question, do we, do we just have a date so I can complete the motion? Like now, before I read it? We do typically discuss that, yes. So, um, yeah, so three days is consistent. So it seems like that's what we would do. But on what, so what date do we do? Do we do the next available three days? How does that work? I, I, don't, I don't know. Well, the decision has to be written and be sent out. So, Mr. Gilberto. Madam Mr. Chair, I could just, you know, and I know you are aware from your time on the board, but the board has, you know, customarily, um, I believe, chosen three, uh, three consecutive days. It's often a weekend, um, and it's pretty fairly consistently been a, a, a holiday weekend as well uh, where that takes place. Um, my only advice to the board would be, um, the, the licensee has the ability, as you know, Madam Chair, to appeal to the Alcoholic Beverage Control Commission. Um, they have five business days to do so. Um, so we ought, I think, allow that time to pass. Um, we can get a decision out fairly, fairly quickly. Um, but, um, you would, we want to allow that time to pass after that. Once that, once that passes and obviously it can go into effect. Madam Chair, may I make a suggestion? Attorney Retzer. In my experience, um, other licensing boards have taken uh, the day of the week of the offense and then used that as the starting point for any suspension. Um, so if, it, if the board is likely to impose the three-day suspension, um, 
I would uh, propose that the board start on a Sunday, Monday, and a Tuesday because the date of the offense was on a Sunday. Thank you, Attorney Rutzer, but that is not how this board typically um, determines the date. Our typically runs over a weekend. So what we do is we, we factor in the timeline that Mr. Gilberto just explained and then um, identify that Friday, Saturday, Sunday, that the, um, that the suspension will occur. So in taking a look at the calendar and, and also assuming we're not going to issue this by certified mail because it'll never make it there. <laughs> that, in, in regards to the certified mail, I just received that mail this morning. Uh, that was uh, mailed on November 5th, just a little FYI. Right. The, the Postal Service is a little slow. That is an understatement, but thank you for, well, we do appreciate your being here and attending for sure. So, um, and appreciate you, you know, not having an issue with the notice as we began this hearing. So uh -huh. it's my mistake and I'll own up to it. So thank you, Mr. Patel. All right. So if we're, if we're to be, be making a determination where we are done with our facts, we're, um, I believe going to be moving to suspend, but Mr. Studa wants us to give him the specific date. So, yeah, okay. I, mean, I suggest December third, fourth, and fifth. Thursday the third, Friday the fourth, Saturday the fifth. Thank you, Mr. O'Leary. Is that um, they give sufficient time for they want to appeal, recognizing that it's a holiday next weekend, difficult to get a hold of people in the state offices and agencies, and all the rest that goes along with it. So. Okay. So we have a motion for a three-day suspension to be um, three consecutive days, December 3rd, 4th, and 5th by Mr. O'Leary. Do I have a second? Second. Well, I have a second. The motion's a little bit, I mean, Mr. Studo can read it exactly as it's printed out. To yep. Can I make a comment before those dates? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. All right. So. We'll back it up. Mrs. Gonzalez wants to make a comment. Uh, just going back to Mr. Gilberto's um, reminding us that we usually do it on a holiday weekend. So I didn't know if we wanted to maybe move a little closer to the Christmas season. Uh, Madam Chair, just a couple. Of things. It isn't always, it has not always been on holiday weekends and things of that nature. Uh, in addition to that, we also are aware that we have an application uh, before us for a transfer of license. I believe that's scheduled for the 7th of December um, by the licensee at this particular point in time. So we want to ensure that the, uh, again, not second guessing what our action is going to be, but we certainly want to impose the um, punishment on the current license holder, not a future license holder. Good point. If there is going to be a future license holder. And again, that's Thank a chair. What at the December 7th. So that's why I chose the, the dates. It's before our December 7th hearing on the. And I don't, my, my recollection is what, what Mr. O'Leary's is. It, it may, it may have been in the past and these don't come up all that often. Right. So we're, you know, but it may have been that at the moment in time that we had a show cause hearing, the discipline just happened to fall on a, you know, a weekend that a, of a holiday. But I don't know that we, we aim for it to be on that. I think it's just a matter of when we have this show cause and then we can, when we schedule it. But. And again, sometimes the weekends, because if there was going to be a Monday holiday, and most of the holidays are on Monday, except for, you know, Veterans Day and uh, Thanksgiving, uh, you know, we may, that's why we generally do it on the weekend so that we send the message that we're serious about this. And yes, it's going to have an economic impact on you, but, you know, we take very seriously, you know, serving minors. So in this particular case, you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday are, are substantial uh, business days for them. And, uh, and again, um, I think some of them happen to coincide with a Monday holiday, and that's why we do it over a weekend. But, Mr. Mr. Studo. So maybe, so... We want to get through the five business days, and today's Monday. So what about, and again, this is just a suggestion, and then I'm fine with any date, but what about the Friday after Thanksgiving, Saturday, Sunday? 
because that's that's a holiday week and if we're going to go the route of the again not you know again i'm just saying that that would that would that would meet the five day you know five business days has to go by and then i mean friday saturday sunday of next week especially with people staying at home would definitely have economic deterrence for future violations and again, my only concern is, you know, we still have to notify them. They're being notified this evening, but they're going to be notified in writing. However, okay. it's going to be delivered. Uh, we have to notify the ABCC. They have a right to appeal. Holiday week. Good luck. You're never going to get hold of anybody. By, by the way, by the way, for, for, for notification purposes, to Mr. O'Leary's point, is there any way, because I've even done it with the post office, but you can get a pretty ironclad signature, adult signature required from FedEx, and they'll guarantee that we can probably get it to anybody by 8.30 the next morning if we have to. I mean, it costs a little bit more, but is there? do we have to use the USPS? Yes. Okay. Thank you. And, I just and, didn't know. And to answer Mr. Studo's question, uh, to get certified overnight from USPS, it's probably 50 bucks versus probably $6 for regular certified mail. I, I just know that from my own law practice. So anyway, just in light of the, the oh, calendar, I, know we the place, I think the third, fourth, and fifth are. I know we hand deliver, and the purpose of that is notification in writing to comply with the statute. So we hand deliver, and we have our uh, officer who delivers certified service upon the licensee, so. Are we gonna hand deliver to the ABCC also? Attendance, but the statute requires a written decision, statement of reasons and decision to be provided that explains why we're taking the action and so that there's something that the applicant can appeal. I would assume in this case where the, app, app, the licensee admitted to sufficient facts, not gonna be much of an appeal attorney rights are. Um, so by the time Mr. O'Leary's right, by the time that that happens, the suspension period will have come and gone. It'll be a mood issue anyway. So um, so in any event, we need to get back to, um, we can definitely hand deliver a notification. It's without a doubt the license, the licensee and licensee counsel are here and knows what the decision is, but it just has to be in writing under the statute. Um, I know we're concerned about USPS and that's not a valid option for us by certified mail to get to the licensee in enough time. So, so Madam Chair, if you want, I'll make the motion. Go I ahead, Mr. I move to suspend for three consecutive days, the package store, all alcohol license of New England beverage, 160 Main Street on December 3rd, 4th and 5th and that the license must be delivered to the North Reading Police Department at the close of business on December 2nd and picked up at the police station at uh, the close of business on December 3rd. Excuse me, December 5th. Okay. I have a motion by Mr. O'Leary. Do I have a, I have a, do I have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Studo. Studo, any further discussion? Madam Chair. Mr. Studo. Mr. Gilberto has a question. Mr. Gilberto. Oh, I, <laughs> I saw you raise your hand, Mr. Studo. That's why I thought you might have a question. Okay, Mr. Gilberto. Just uh, to clarify, the license would normally be picked up the day after the suspension. Okay. To be the license would be picked up at the police station on December 6th. Thank you. Thank you. Second, I would second that. I appreciate it. Second. Okay. Second, so <laughs> so it'll be clear in the decision. Yes. December third, fourth, fifth of is the motion closed, suspended for those three days. The license is to be dropped off December second to the police department. The license can be picked up December sixth from the police department. That's the motion, Mr. Studo seconded the motion. Does anyone have any further discussion or questions on the motion? Seeing none, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. Studo. 
Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Menu Pelli is aye. Okay. All right. So you'll get that. I'm assuming it's going to get hand delivered. So, it will be, yes. I mean, that will be the fastest me method to provide it to you to with a copy to attorney Rudd. So do we have your um, information on I record? Mr. Gilberto has it, but um, I can send another email in the morning. Okay. With my information. That would be great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And thank you for your presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Okay. Good night. Thank you. Okay. Our next order of business is to review annual license fees. This was a topic of discussion um, that I brought up um, as a general discussion at our last meeting. And so because votes may be taken and we got uh, further information from our finance department, I actually have a family member that works for an establishment. So I'm going to recuse myself and not participate in any further discussion of this, just in an abundance of caution. Um, there's n not really a conflict. Nevertheless, I want to make sure that I recuse myself for a family member that will be participating. So I'm going to turn the chair over to Mrs. Gonzalez and remain silent. Okay, so do we have further information? We do, um, through you, Madam Vice Chair. Um, in response to the board's request, we have provided two documents um, on pages 48 and 49 of the meeting packet. Page 48 is a listing of um, license fees for 2021 for all establishments that have a common victualler license, which means that they are able to serve food um, for um, consumption on the premises. And then we have further noted those that have a uh, common victualler, all alcoholic, fraternal, or wine and malt beverage um, license um, as well. And as the board members know, those are the, 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 the genesis of the discussion was the so-called section 12 licensees, which are the establishments that have the ability to serve alcohol on the premises. Um, you can see them, um, they're, they're noted uh, on there in uh, pretty much alphabetical order. Um, and you can see the totals that the different fees um, come up to by category. Um, we've reviewed the receipts to date overall for the town's financial picture through November 12th, 2020. And we provided a document on page 49 that compares it with um, the same time period ending November 12th, 2019. Um, for those of you on the financial planning team, this is a document you're used to seeing. Um, we just updated it to the, reflect the most, the, the date for which the most recent information was available. And I think probably the most important thing to, to answer the board's question is where we stand overall in the receipts. If you look down the bottom, the, the very bottom, the grand total, we're um, at on the far right-hand side, about 48% of receipts to date. When you compare that to where we were at this time last year, we're about two percentage points ahead where we're at 46%. And uh, I know um, there was some question about the, the sort of largest revenue generator, our real estate revenues. Again, same story, 49% received to date this fiscal year compared to 47% in the previous fiscal year. So um, I think it's you know, fair to say that we are, we're on target in terms of where we are, are hoping to be for receipts um, at this stage. Um, we've talked multiple times about the fact that our assumptions are conservative for this current fiscal year. And I'm sure that we are um, benefiting from that conservative approach. Um, but con um, you know, talking with Ms. Rourke, the finance director, you know, we feel that for a, a one-time reduction of the Section 12 alcoholic beverage licenses fees of the amount of 50% for calendar year 2021 renewals, that we could um, absorb that in this current year. We would not, uh, as much as I think we all would like to be able to make that commitment moving forward if the economic uncertainty continues. I just, I don't know that we can make that commitment, but right now for purposes of this discussion, it would be for next calendar year. And I think she and I feel that we could absorb that reduction, which when you do the quick math, it's that category fee two, alcohol license fee two on page 48, the total revenues, $46,775. Um, we would effectively be um, cutting that in half. Um, 
down to roughly $23,375 in revenue in that category with um, the um, licensees only having to pay half of their alcoholic beverage uh, fee to renew. And I'm gonna stop for a moment um, and just ask the finance director just to affirm or add any additional information to my comment about our ability to absorb this and add anything else that she would like if it's okay for you, Madam Vice Chair. Liz, did you want to add anything? No. Oh, did your audio cut out, Liz? Can you hear me? No, we cannot hear you. We can see that you've unmuted. Oh, we see that you're gone. <laughs> So does anybody want to discuss a little bit while we're waiting for Liz? Any questions? No, uh, Madam Vice Chair, I have, um, I actually had a couple of um, licensees reach out to me since our last meeting and it was not so much that they uh, were watching our meeting or knew what was going on, but there's been some circulation amongst the industry, um, amongst themselves as to what other communities have been doing as, uh, as Chairman Manupelli had been indicating before. And they were wondering if the board was inclined to do anything for them. Um, so I had a little bit of discussion with a couple of the uh, licensees, and I, I said that we would be considering it at this meeting. Uh, but I also asked, you know, where are you at? And um, one of them was very free to offer that, you know, through October, their li liquor sales were down 52%. You know, so obviously now we're looking at uh, these restaurants being shut down Thursday, Friday, Saturday, earlier also. So that's gonna impact their sales. And uh, these are vital members of our community. Uh, um, have been, most of them have been here for years. Uh, I, I see no problem you know, with us uh, absorbing this and sharing a little bit of the pain with them and trying to assist them along. I mean, we want them to survive. And if we can do this and assist them, that's a good thing. And again, overall, uh, if we asked the finance director and town administrator to take a look at the financial impact. It appears as though um, we'll be fine. So I'm, I'm in favor of the 50% reduction at this point. Liz, are you with us? I'm back now. Okay. Okay, Liz. So we had a little discussion while we waited, but go ahead and, and um, tell us what you want to tell us. Sure. I think, you know, my audio shuts off on these Zoom meetings once they've passed a certain amount of time. So um, it happened earlier and it keeps happening. So um, as the town administrator mentioned, uh, we can uh, afford to do this. My only concern is, you know, what happens next year and the year after and the year after. So I'm just giving you that caution. Um, you know, this year we can do it. Um, it's minor in the grand scheme of things, it's minor in our total estimated receipts, but I just want to caution, you know, as we continue to go forward, we don't know, you know, what FY22 will bring. We don't know, you know, if there's going to be, you know, a whole nother shutdown. Um, but I just want everybody to be aware that, you know, I don't know that this is a long-term sustainable, um, thing that we can do. I think it's a great thing to do, um, but it just, we need to just be careful of the sustainability of it. I don't think any of us are thinking long-term. I think we're thinking right now, at least I am, um, you know, just helping out, helping these businesses out. Um, Mr. Studo, do you have any thoughts? No, same. I, I think that this one time, yeah. I mean, yeah, it, it's uh, more more than the amount. I mean, because granted, it's not going to make or break, but it's a, you know, like Mr. O'Leary kind of referenced it. It's a show of good faith right. that, you know, just if we can do something, we will do something, even though, again, I mean, when you when you break it down, I don't know if twenty twenty five hundred dollars or whatever it is, is going to do whatever. But it's still something like just, uh, you know. So I, I'm in agreement with it to do it for this year. Okay. And uh, Mr. Walner? Yeah, I was, I'm, I'm soft on this one. I was resistant last time, but I think I feel 
a little better about it now, especially since I know it's right statewide they're doing it. So and Mr. Sudo is correct. It's uh it's not really that big of a boost, but it is a nice gesture on our part. So you know, but it is a one time deal. I don't see it happening again next year. So all right. So I have two thoughts. Um, I feel like if we're going to do half for the alcohol, um, I don't want to leave out the common victualler. I mean, I, I feel like I, what it, what is the board's pleasure in, in me entertaining that those common victualler be able to not pay the 100 or or even or give them a break on the 100 if they don't have an alcohol license. I feel like, I feel like we're, we're helping out the alcohol and, but we're not helping out the common. What do you, any thoughts on that? Better vice chair. I just, for most of the other businesses that we're talking about, the impact has not been substan as, as substantial as it has been for these other restaurants. I mean, the restaurants were actually shut down. A lot of the other licenses, whether it be the um, you know, convenience stores or whether it be the, uh, um, you know, the pizza and sub shops and those, they, they, some of their businesses have been fine. You know, they've actually been doing very well and uh, actually make it up for some of the restaurants being closed. And as far as the convenience stores, again, the same foot traffic is there or the same. And again, the convenience of being able to pick up a six pack or something like that or a bottle of wine. Uh, I don't think their business has been harmed as much as the restaurants. So that's that's why last week, last meeting we were talking about, I was saying, you know, which ones are we talking about and which ones are most adversely impacted? And I think it's the restaurants. That's a good point. Um, my other thought is there's one that stands out here, and that's the Hillview, which I happen to know that we all happen to know was already not in operation before COVID. Um, so I'm not feeling real generous <laughs> towards that. And I don't know if we can, if I might, uh, if, if I might uh, on that particular one, obviously I'm the liaison to the Hillview uh, commission and been uh, intimately involved with what's, what's going on there. I mean, um, as far as the, the pub being closed, that was done, uh, with the consent of the commission at the time, not just for this licensee, but the previous licensee also had shut the pub down. Um, so the previous licensee before uh, um, GOE has been operating it, asked for it to be shut down, the commission allowed it to happen. This licensee took over the license, tried it, it wasn't working, went to the commission and agreed. Now, part of the, the license is obviously the, uh, the function hall. That's been shut down by, by the state government. You know, you can't have anybody, more than 25 people. Um, there'd be an echo chamber at the Hillview upstairs in the ballroom. So they had been unable to, uh, to function, uh, function, function with functions, you know, since, since March. So again, through no fault of their own in that particular case. So that one alcohol license covers both of those establishments? Correct. The entire building. Yep. And again, as far as the pub being closed, that was a, an economic decision that was made by both the previous licensee and this licensee in, con in concert with the, uh, with the commission that it just wasn't generating enough to s substantiate keeping it open. So to answer your question, Mrs. Gonzalez, there are two licenses at the Hillview. Yeah. The Hillview Country Club license, uh, common victual or all alcoholic in the amount of $4,600 is in fact for the function facility only. The um, GFMI incorporating doing business as Hillview Snacks has a seasonal wine and malt license that we granted as part of the uh, transition from the pub uh, when the pub closed. So um, that's a separate entity with a separate license. And in fact, it's actually a separate premises um, adjacent to the uh, clubhouse. Um, so there are, there are two different licenses over at that facility at this point, but they're not in the same building. But if, but if, if the function hall had the pub, they'd be under the same license. Yes. They were under, they were, when the pub was operating, it was under one license. Yes. And so uh, we did, then we issued a separate license, an additional license to GFMI out of the pro shop. Correct. Right. Yeah, so that's a conversation for another day. Yeah, um, I'd, be, I'd be hesitant to pick out 
you know, one right. or two okay. special consideration. I think we're heading down a dangerous path with that thing. All yeah. right. So anyone else, any, any more conversation on that? Or do we want to take a vote? Uh, Madam Vice, Madam Vice Chair, yeah. move to reduce by 50% alcohol license fees to Section 12 license establishments for calendar year 2021. Second. All right, I have a motion by Mr. Studo, and I have a second from Mr. O'Leary. Um, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. <laughs> Mr. Walner. Aye. And Mrs. Gonzalez, aye. And um, Chair Kate Manupelli uh, recuses. <clears throat> Mrs. Manupelli, are you there? You took an early out on us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe she took a bathroom break. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, move on to the next item. Yeah, let's move on. All right, let's move on. Um, we're on to Center for Tech and Civil Life Election Grant. Yes. Okay. Oh, thank you, Madam. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, shall I continue? All set. Sure. Yes. So this is a grant that uh, was identified um, by the town clerk uh, in conjunction with her colleagues in the statewide association. Um, it resulted in uh, funding being available to the, uh, the town in the amount of $5,842. Um, and so this is uh, funding that can go to defray costs associated with the election and it's being provided by the Center for Tech and Civic Life. I have talked with town council with regard to the acceptance of this and uh, they felt that it was um, uh, able to be accepted um, by vote of the select board. Um, we, it would be used to uh, be applied to reduce costs for uh, the election, um, including salaries, PPE, signage, supplies, mailing costs, any of the costs that are associated with providing safe and secure elections. I would just further note that, as you know, there are a number of um, state and federal funding sources that are out there. And you know, we would be sure not to um, double count any sort of reimbursement or otherwise. And that's obviously an important part of uh, the tracking and the steps that we would take. But for this particular grant, uh, it would require the acceptance of a, a, a gift by the select board. And we have prepared a motion accordingly for the board to consider. Thank you, Mr. Gilberto. Any questions? Any questions? It's in the packet. It's pretty self-explanatory in terms of the purpose and the terms and conditions. So do we have a motion? Madam Chair, I move to accept the grant in the amount of $5,842.50 from the Center for Tech and Civic Life for planning and oper operationalizing safe and secure election administration in North Reading in 2020. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. And Manny Pelli is aye. And Mr. Gilberto, who was responsible for applying for that, locating and applying for that? The town clerk. That's great. We should just give her a, a note of thanks for being resourceful and being successful at being resourceful. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. I will pass that along, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. Our next order of business is agreement with DPW Teamsters Local 25. Vote to ratify. Mr. Gilberto. Madam Chair, uh, this is a uh, agreement with the union that represents our um, Department of Public Works, many of our Department of Public Works employees. 
Um, they had a collective bargaining agreement that the town was a party to that expired on June 30th of this year. Um, negotiations have been occurring um, over the past few months um, with the board being represented by um, select board members Gonzalez and Walner, um, along with myself, the operations manager for DPW, Chris Deming, who I believe is still on the meeting this evening, the finance director who was here earlier, and the human resources director, Robert Collins. Um, we all worked hard with the leadership of the union um, to uh, identify um, and come up with this um, memorandum of agreement. This would be a one year agreement covering fiscal year 2021, running from July 1st, 2020 to June 30th, 2021. It proposes a wage increase in the amount of 1.5%. Uh, it also proposes um, a, a couple of new and increased amounts related to particular um, stipends for particular areas in which folks can get licensed or trained. Um, and they were identified by the town as a, a, an area where we were looking to try to incentivize more folks to become um, trained and qualified in particular areas, including um, particular levels of the CDL licensing and water treatment, uh, which uh, is required. Um, it will be required in the future, even as we move away from having our own water treatment facilities, we still are required to do a minimum level of oversight of our water supply. Um, and distribution system, I should say, not water supply, but water distribution system. Um, there's also some changes relative to um, compensation associated with um, 24 hours continuous work um, for members of the unit. Um, this unit is a bit unique in that there are not staggered shifts, they're all on one shift. And so when we have snow and ice events, they are required to work an extended period of time, um, generally with all hands on deck. Um, we have um, prepared a motion for the board to consider um, as well uh, to ratify the approval of this. And if the board's so willing, um, we would appreciate a vote on it. Okay. okay. That was a great summary. If there's no further questions, do I have a motion? Madam Chair, I move to ratify the agreement between the town of North Reading and DPW Teamsters Local 25 for a period to commence July 1, 2020 to June 30, 2021. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Studo and a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. And the chair is aye. And thank you, Mr. Deming, and thank you to uh, Mrs. Gonzalez and Mr. Walker <clears throat> and Mr. Gilberto and obviously Ms. Rourke and our team and the um, Teamsters team for getting this squared away and putting it together. We always like to see these completed, done, signed, sealed, and delivered. So thank you to all that were involved in that. And our next order of business, our legal bills, Mr. Studo. Madam Chair, I move to approve legal bills for September 2020 in the amount of 11,474.70 as follows. General 6911.70, Labor 2437.50, 20 Elm Street 2125.50 for a total of 11,474.70. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez, Mr. Walner, aye. Mr. Studo, aye. Manny Pelli is aye. Next order of business is the town administrator's report. Mr. Gilberto. Madam Chair, thank you. Just two items to report um, this evening in lieu of a written report. The first is that we did have household hazardous waste day on Saturday morning from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Um, there were some folks in line, I think, beginning um, before the event opened, um, and we saw um, quite a bit of activity uh, during the course of the, of the morning um, with, I believe, over 200 cars uh, being served um, at, the, um, um, at the event. I want to thank the leadership in the DPW, um, particularly um, Chris, the acting director, who is on the call here this evening, along with his staff, Amy Dechara and uh, Jenny uh, Puglia. Uh, who staffed the event uh, and were friendly faces meeting our residents uh, on Saturday morning. Um, you know, we didn't know whether we were going to be able to have this event. And I know that as people are sort of 
homebound and trying to clean things out. Um, you know, there were many folks who were looking for this opportunity to properly dispose of items. And uh, I was really proud that Chris and, and Amy and Jenny were able to, to find a way to get this done when many places were not offering this service um, or deferred it for a year. Many vendors were just not doing it for the year. Um, they, they hunted and found um, the, the right vendor to do it for us um, at a reasonable cost. And um, I think it was a good thing for the, for the town. So Chris, thank you very much for that. Um, the other thing that I will note is some residents will begin receiving a notification um, relative to um, uh, uh, um, an, uh, uh, chemical identified as TTHM in water, um, in the town's uh, water um, distribution system. So this is not the first time this notice has come out in recent months. As a matter of fact, uh, it was a similar notice that went out, I believe, in March or April of this year. And um, when folks see it there, I mean, there's obviously going to be some concerns and questions, but I think it's really important to note that what you're seeing in that notice is something that's required by the state, reflective of testing that goes back over the course of a year to last October. And that uh, when we come up with the calculations, we are required to average the year's worth of tests, so four quarterly tests. We had high test results in October and January, October 2019, January of 2020, that really pushed us up over the limit for that February, for that March um, report that we fi filed. As this board knows, and as I think most of the community knows, um, the wells that were contributing to that um, have um, been taken offline, um, effective in January of this year. And so what we're seeing is that there's a residual impact that those high numbers were having back from October and January that are driving that average up to above the reportable level. Um, but that the recent testing that's happened for both the April, May, and June and uh, July, August, June, July, August quarter indicated that we were below those levels with the water we were drawing from the town of Andover as our water supply. So um, or we had some miscommunication internally. We ordinarily try to put those new, those uh, publications out on the website ahead of time so that residents know to expect them and it answers the questions. And this one uh, just got out a bit ahead of that process. Um, uh, and, uh, and so I think it may be a surprise to some folks when it comes in the mail. But you know, in fact, it's reflective of testing that's occurred going back a year. And when we made the transition to fully and over for water back in um, January of this year, um, we effectively you know, took a step that in addition to the PFAS issue would move to re resolve that, that um, test level from coming back and uh, once we've gotten through the appropriate number of quarters so that it drops off. So long story short, it's not reflective of a current test. It's reflective of an average going back to October of last year. And uh, as time moves forward, we should see that number come down further and not trip that notification requirement. Um, and there is no action that our residents need to take with regard to the water. Um, the water does uh, meet the water meets the standards that it needs to meet for us to be able to use it as drinking water. And I know Chris is here. Chris, you want to add anything to that? No, I think that that pretty much sums it up. Uh, like you had said, you know, those numbers were based off the high numbers were based off last last October and last January. So those uh, the recent numbers are, are where we want them, um, and we're not using those wells anymore. Thank you, thank you for sticking with us too, Mr. Deming. All right. Um, can we have any questions for Mr. Gilberto? Who would like to ask Mr. Gilberto some questions? Mr. O'Leary. I, Mr. Have, no, I have no questions for Mr. Gilberto. Okay. I misread your face there. All right. Mrs. Gonzalez. Good. Nothing. Mr. Walner. Good. Mr. Studo. All set. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Gilberto. Thank you. Next to order, order business is old and new business. Mr. O'Leary. Uh, I just can like to comment on uh, I mean, last time we met was the day before the election and uh, a lot was going on and uh, it was heartening to see so many people to participate uh, in the electoral process. I mean, we had uh, record numbers and I think this whole process of uh, early voting and mail-in voting um, encourages people to participate and that's a good thing. I don't care which side of the aisle you're on or anything else and I think it should be encouraged and I I'm still disheartened by the fact that, you know, so much effort was put into discouraging people from participating at this level. And uh, I think our local clerk and the registrars uh, did a terrific job of uh, rising to the task because it was quite a task and quite an undertaking. But I think it's probably foretells what, what 
we can expect going forward. And uh, again, to me, the more participation, the better. It should be easy to vote. It shouldn't be a hardship, and you shouldn't have to stand in line for hours. Um, and when you vote, um, when you vote by mail or you vote early, uh, your vote should be counted, you know, and there shouldn't be any attempts to uh, not count any legally um, cast ballot. So, and again, as far as, you know, the, the results themselves, uh, again, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, for our own electorate here, you know, over 58% of the people who voted in North Reading, you know, chose uh, common decency and truth over lies, and I think that's a good thing. And again, uh, you know, we have an electoral college vote of 306 to 232, as it was four years ago, just with a different result. And people are unaccepting this time, and we were more accepting last time. So it's unfortunate what's going on. I would hope that the transition would take place and be smooth because it, it matters significantly. And I, and I think we should hear more from uh, some of our elected public officials um, calling on the administration to transfer things over smoothly. I just think it's, uh, it's unfortunate. And again, to continue on with this effort to discredit what took place, which was monumental, is, uh, is, is, is unfortunate. So, so uh, to me, I think it's great. The participation level was terrific. I think the process was terrific. And uh, we, should, uh, we should encourage it going forward. Okay, thank you, Mr. Are you all set, Mr. O'Leary? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, M Mr. Studo. Um, well, again, I'll echo the participation rate looks great based on how many people in North Reading, um, which is nice. Um, I'd say that uh, I think it's time to move on, especially in North Reading, where I mean, you know, and again, um, I've always tried to keep the opinions as I like to say center as possible because, um, you know, nationwide, I think we realized that the moderates won again, like they always do. And that's just a fact. I know, so, you know, neither side wants to admit it, but that's how I see it, that the center usually does. And then, so I feel like we should move forward, not demonize. I think we'll get past that. But also remember, for a town in mass, you know, the facts are the facts. 41% voted for Trump. That's a fact. That's 41%. So, you know, I'm just saying that that's 4,000 people plus that we live in town here, just like 58, like Mr. O'Leary said, or whatever the number was. So I'm happy it's over so we can move on and, uh, you know, get back to the business of whatever business, governing. Uh, so... And that's uh, that's all I got. There's no new business yet. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Studo. Mr. Walner, old or new board business? <laughs> no, I think uh, I'm looking forward to next Tuesday when we have our strategic meeting and we can kind of regroup again. Thank you. Okay. Excellent. Mrs. Gonzalez, old or new board business? I'm good, thank you. Okay, I just want to, from the chair, thank Sue Magner and also thank NORCAM for putting together something to celebrate Veterans Day, to commemorate the day um, in a different way because uh, due to the pandemic, it was uh, uh, people are commenting about the NORCAM um, presentation that was put together, which was kind of a montage of different um, you know, different uh, talks and items for veterans. So thank you, Sue. Thank you to everybody that submitted things for inclusion in that. Thank you for NORCAM for not letting the day go without doing something special for, vet for our veterans. And also, I think this is our last meeting for before Thanksgiving. So to wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving, a safe and happy peaceful thanksgiving unusual thanksgiving because there's maybe less people at the table for safety reasons but hopefully just to wishing you and your family for anyone that's even paying attention at this late hour a happy thanksgiving and to my colleagues and to to um the ta and all of the and jane and everybody that helps us out this has been an unbelievable year 
uh, half a year starting with COVID. So just an unbelievable year. So we're so appreciative of the effort that you already put in, but the monumental effort that COVID-19 has required of all of you. So we want to thank all the people that work for the town and all the people that work on our behalf in the town too. So that is all. Do we have a motion to motion adjourn? To, motion to adjourn. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo. Second by Mr. O'Leary. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. And you probably is aye. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.